What's up, man? Uh, it's good to connect. I watched what you did with um, Brandy and MS and and uh, Chaz and Maddie, and yeah. I think what you're doing here is great. You know, um, keeping guys uh, close together and communicating with each other and sharing a a couple of probably partially true war stories occasionally, <laughs> right. uh, but ho- hopefully stitching those into more valuable lessons that everyone can learn from. Yeah, Young guys sure. and old guys too. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I just, it got to the point where um, I guess uh, maybe a year or two ago, my brother and I were talking about it and he started one kind of in the same vein. And um, yeah, we just feel like there's a, so many good stories out there that people don't hear. You know what I mean? That Like just guys that we know. I mean, we hear about all the kind of high level stuff or maybe more popular type units that, you know, are have a little more PR than say the 17th does. Um, but I, I this, the stories you, that you and, and everybody else you mentioned and other people are, are so great. I just wanted a place for them to be heard. You know what I mean? I wanted people yeah. to be able to come and listen to this, this the amazing things you guys have done. You um, as well, by the way, one of the, one of these uh, sessions, we need to flip the script and, <laughs> and we need to interview you as well. Sign me up for that, by the way. <laughs> well, the the problem with that is number one, they're not that good, and number two, I got such a horrible memory that like I don't even know if I can remember half the stuff. I'd have to bring in like guys that were there with me to say, "Hey, remember that stuff?" I'm like, "Oh yeah," because I just I don't know, man. It's my my memory's not what it used to be for sure. Well, you well, for, I mean specifically on that, you should be writing all that stuff down. Yeah, you know that's Matt, Maddie, and I. You know, we live, we're both here in Northwest Florida now, so we get to talk often. And uh, we were just talking about that recently, capturing um, all those things. You know, when I retired, one of the things I did, I had quite a bit of um, time. My my transition was a little unusual, but it afforded me a a pretty fair amount of time to dedicate to myself and, and prepping for retirement, which I'm thankful for. Um, but what I did for myself, because I realized, um, it's, it's going to get away from me. The older I get is, you know, when I went to, uh, harms and they gave me my final copy of my jump records, I went back and I looked through every single jump and, um, in a copy of those jump records, I made notes next to any of the big jumps and what happened on them. Right. And there's, you know, if you looked at your records now, there's jumps on there that you have, you cannot remember at all. You're like, I have no idea what happened. Years of jumping. You're like, nothing ever happened. Right. But I'm able to look back, you know, you'll remember some of these infamous days, but I'm like, oh yeah, that's the day that I hit the trees at Arkman. And I sat there for eight (laughs) hours waiting for the fire department to come out with a ladder truck and Sean O'Neill got like, you know, called in from Ranger school with a rope team to try to get me down. Like that's important. <laughs> yeah. so I made notes on that, you know, yeah. Um, all the 18 and 25,000 foot hay hose. Like I made notes on those, you know, what went right, what went wrong. Um, Cause I want to remember those, but I did the same thing on my cast logs, you know? Oh uh, yeah. Um, and, and everywhere else. But the interesting thing is, those records are really um, a, a sequential sort of uh, journal of our experiences as jumpers and JTACs. And there's not a lot of other things that do that. You know, right. I get your EPRs probably is another good example. Um, but those but, are kind of like more general, though. Like, you know, those are, you know, yeah, they're not, they're, they, don't, they don't really nail down like a time per se, but like you were saying, like, with a yeah, jump and a, and a control log, there's like date, time, you know, situation, location, all yeah. that stuff is right there. Yeah. And there's things that we don't put in our EPRs all the time that are important to us as we get older. The truth, I, I'm going to try to keep the cursing to a minimum, but you know me, when I get excited, I start. Um, Just like cursing. I told Brandy, go ahead and do it. I got the tools to bleep out. It's no um, big deal. Change it to, like, what are you going to change it to? Like chicken noises or like beats? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't going to, but now I am. <laughs> um, you know, half of the stuff on our EPRs, we're not going to care, not half, but a little bit of the stuff on our EPRs, we won't care about when we're 60 years old. We're not going to look at it and go, oh, 
Yep, that I remember that. That's the year I did that life changing car wash, and <laughs> and and raised money for the squadron Christmas party. Man, I mean right. that is the kind of stuff that I tell my kids about today. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Um, but you know, don't you uh, unless you're on some sort of really specialized team for an extended period of time. And by the way, I think you and I were both on really specialized team. Wore my shirt today. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Uh, you don't do a lot of 25,000 foot hay hose. Mm -mm. You probably, most guys, even if you're on a recce team, you might do, you know, less than 10 or 12 in your career. You're going to do a lot of jumps, but you're just not going to go up to that altitude that often. Right. And so the few times that you do, it's important to have a memory of those because in my opinion, those are, those are critical life experiences right there that um, that environment is something that most other people, most people will never experience. I sent you some talking points that I captured on my thoughts on that, um, that I spent quite a bit of time trying, you know, how would I explain what that's like to somebody who's never done it? Yeah. You know, even somebody who says, yeah, I'm a static line jumper. Like, how do you explain that? I'm not talking about skydiving here. You could, right. you could in a short amount of time, relatively, uh, with a bunch of money, you could go do a 25,000 foot jump at a drop zone. You could find a place to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do it at night with a recce team out of the back of a C-130 under NVGs with no lights on the aircraft, no lights on the jumpers, no lights on the drop zone, you want to do that? No, no. That takes you years. Yeah. Hundreds thousands of little training events that all culminate in that one thing. And that one thing, by the way, how, you know, how, how long does that even last? Right. You know, from the time, you know, on, now on a, uh, you know, if you're at a low level, you're at a static line operation, you might be over the drop zone for like 30 seconds and you're in the air for 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. Right now in a 25,000 foot hay ho you're probably going to be in the air for 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah. But even that, even if you say, Hey, that's a 30 minute infill, how many hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of man hours on that team went into that 30 minute operation? Right. It's so yeah. intense. It's yeah, amazing. It's not just you. It's the air crew. It's the Everybody. DZSO. It's the, yeah. you know, all the planners involved. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 If you tried to measure that, if you said, how long does it take a pot? How many hours of training does it take for a pilot to fly that mission? How many hours does it take for a crew chief to run? How many hours for the fizz tech? How many hours for every guy in the team? Right. If somebody should do that. I should probably do that. <laughs> yeah. Is the answer. You right? know how it is. It's like if you but, come up with it, you got to yeah, do I'm it. Like, right? <laughs> uh, damn it. Things to do. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's just, by the way, I should write it on a post it. And I got I got a rabbit hole here for a minute with you on a funny memory. Sure, sure. Um, but yeah, it's so important, man. And I hope we can talk about that, but you know, th the point of saying all that was I took the time to write those things down. And that's what I told Maddie was I said, write those things down, man. And now I tell guys, you know, I'm not like some pro civilian now I've been retired for five months, you know, and I don't think right. I've messed it up that bad yet. <laughs> um, but I try to tell guys like, number one, your things, you're not going to have more time as when you're retired, unless you're going to sell all your shit and go live on a boat in the Caribbean, which I think is a great idea, but yeah. it's not going to happen for most of us. The reality is you're probably going to be busier when you're out of the military than you were when you were in. For sure. You're going to hustle uh, so a lot more when you're, you're out. For sure. You're going to hustle. That's exactly right. Um, so take the time to capture all those important details wh while they're fresh on your mind. Because you're going to you're going to want to look back on them later. You're going to be glad to look. You're going to be proud to look back on them later. Sure. Um, and you should be. All of us yeah. should be. And by the way, you know, I feel like it, I, I feel like this is old guy talk, but it is. It, it is what it is. Like th the war is over. The war, yep. you know, for the most part, you know what I mean? The yep. GWA is over. But for us. That absolutely, without a doubt, defined our military careers. Oh, 100%. Yep. We all did some stuff before it, you know, and we did some stuff after it. But what we did before and after will not be, it, it doesn't define our, it, it wasn't uh, such a contributing factor to who we are as individuals. It didn't, 
uh, uh, chisel out our character the way that fighting deployment after deployment did. And, yep. and we had, you know, you know, this is why I talked to, I, I, you have to make the effort to do this, but I do still talk to a lot of the guys that I used to deploy with um, on the, on the ROC team. I talked mm -hmm. to, you know, I'm going to keep it all first names here, but you'll know who I mean. And some of these guys are still, and I talk to Sean all the time still. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we talk about how, uh, you know, Sean kept journals on his, you know, unclassified journals on his deployments of which I did six, six deployments with him. And I'm like, Dude, I'd love to read those one day because right. for, Same here. for, for yeah. six years, every mission you were on, I was on. And, right. prob and, and I'm, I don't think he had any entries about me other than, you know, how he was probably, you know, thought how good looking I was and how he <laughs> right, was, right. you know, admiring me quietly from a distance. <laughs> um, but Maybe not at a distance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he probably, you know, captured some. Um, key points about missions that we were on that I've already forgot. Sure. And if I yep. read those, I would go, oh, that's that did happen. That's yep. right. Because as you'll remember during that period of time, like nobody took pictures back then. Absolutely. Yeah. If you were working with the regiment or you were working with the joint task force, if you if you brought a, a, a camera on the objective to take some pictures of you, some selfies, oh, no, you would no, get no. absolutely crushed. No yeah. way. Okay? Well, I mean, it wasn't even possible really for a selfie. I mean, you know, at Recce, we had all kinds of camera equipment, but it was more, you know, you couldn't turn a, a like a digital camera on yourself or anything, you know, <laughs> yeah. so. A 500 millimeter lens. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so no. Because we were always, you know, this is, you know, we'll get into this more, but our mentality was every single mission, you as well, you know this, every single mission you went on, you said, I have to I have to prep my kid as if I'm going to get rolled up on this mission. Right. Every single mission you went on, you looked at everything you had and thought, if I get rolled up by the enemy right now, what are they going to use against me? And if you had a camera with a bunch of selfies on it, game over. Yeah. How are you going to deny what you do? How are you going to handle yourself in that situation if you're giving them, you know? But the difference is now, and I, I'm not trying to make um unhelpful comparisons and I'm I'm proud of all the young guys that are fighting now but I think it's different because they do they do bring cell phones with them everywhere they're going they're taking pictures and they're capturing you know I see even guys who are uh you know active duty putting things on social media and I'm like I don't know how they're getting footage of this man this yeah. is crazy yeah. like guys jumping and they're in they're under canopy, right. you know, taking selfies. And I'm like, that's crazy, man. I never would have dared do that. I was yeah. always so concerned with, I, I wouldn't have a personal device on me anyway. Right. Um, and if I was under canopy, I was worried about staying in the stack, man, not, you know, <laughs> right. getting footage, but yeah. But listen, I got off to a, a long start there. You know me. I no, like was good. Ball. But one that quick was... fun memory for you. Oh, uh, yeah. I still, to this day, use a ton of Post-its. And oh, yeah. every day, I have a list of things I'm going to do. Okay? I, I'm the same way. I still use them. Yes. I, got that, I mean, I don't know. I'm pretty sure. I want to say that I got that from you because I remember seeing your truck, and there was always like, you know, three or four Post-its on the dashboard or, yes. you know, where the speedometer was. I'm like, that's brilliant. You know, because I always used to have a pad of paper that I would write everything. I'd make lists, and then I'd have to redo the list because after everything, you know, this would become overcome by events. I'd have to take that off or whatever. But with the Post-it, yeah, you're like, oh, I cannot forget this. Post it right to my phone or right to right. my wallet or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Right. So right now, on my desk here below, you know, below the screen, I probably have 20 miscellaneous Post-its. And my Sunday night ritual now is, I, you know, I will – um, you know, before the day is over, sit down and get organized for the week and I'll structure right. everything I need to do. But I can remember being in a flight at one point. And, you know, when we were there, when you were in the office, if you were in the office, it was because you were between deployments or cash trips or jump trips. You, like nobody ever had two or three or four consecutive weeks where you just went to work and spent the day at work like right. that's just not the life that we led 
yeah. which which is who, what made us who we are today, you know. But um, what that means is when you were in an office, you always had shit to do. Yeah. Okay. You, 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 your first priority was probably to recover from whatever you just got done doing, right? Do a voucher you, or whatever, you know. Yeah. Rehab all your gear, replace anything that was broken, clean everything. You probably have a list of things that you found out you didn't know how to do on that trip. And now you had all these new things to learn as fast as you possibly could. Oh, and by the way, you had to get your travel voucher done and your cybersecurity probably expired and you can't get on a computer until you've done (laughs) to do any of that stuff until that's done. All right. Um, And and then on top of it, you had other life things that, you know, had to be done, like you know, whatever it was. And I used to write it all in a post-it, but I can remember um, coming, you know, I went to like go use the bathroom or something. And when I came and everyone was in the office for some reason, which was rare. And I came back and my freaking post-it was gone. And I was like, (laughs) where is my list? Where is my to-do list? And everyone in all, you know, it was like Mark and Maddie and Richie and, and Gav, I'm sure you were in there. And, yeah. And somebody had taken my post-it and I was so pissed. I was like, I don't know what to do next. <laughs> I had so many things to do, but I don't know which one to do next. And I, I won't get any of them done. If I don't have my post-it, somebody give it back. <laughs> and, you know, it was just the way we did, all Did somebody take it to mess with you or did it just blow off or what happened? No. Was, yeah. One of the guys took it and was like hiding it for me to see me squirm. <laughs> that sounds and about right. And then eventually I, you know, left again and I came back and it was on the desk and nobody ever told me who did it. But, yeah. you know, that's what, they, that's what we they, did. They probably weren't expecting that reaction. So they're like, oh, man, <laughs> <laughs> I need to sneak it back on for it has yes. a breakdown. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love that. I, keep, I tell everybody that's on here. I, that was the best time. That was the funnest time I've ever had was going into that office every day. Um, Cause like, I, like, like to your, like you said, it was so cool hearing about what everybody got, just got done doing. Like you, we all did cool stuff, I guess, for whatever, but you hear another guy did something different than you did. And you're like, yeah, man, tell me all about it. And it was just fun yeah. sharing stories and, you know, training events and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's exactly right. You know, um, and I listened to some of the other, um, interviews you've been doing lately. And, um, you know, when I went up to the, uh, 17th reunion, which was last May, which is good. I got to go kick around the squadron and I just left there five years ago. You know, I was there twice, you know that. Yep. But even in the five years since I left in 17, it's changed so much. Uh, really? It just, it, it always did. You know, even I was gone for like four years between assignments. And when I got back, I felt like it was totally different. But, um, you know, I what you just said is is real. And I spent some time. I tried to emphasize that to the guys who are there now without sounding like that old crazy guy that they all, you know, brush off. But right. I went into the team rooms and I saw the guy sitting in what you and I knew as B flight and A flight. They call them, uh, I think they're calling them troops now. Um, yeah. But I told them, I'm like, hey, you guys who are staff sergeants, tech sergeants, master sergeants, you're you're, you're an E7 JTAC evaluator, free fall JM. Right now, this week, this month, this year is the best uh, time of your life. Yep. I know if no one has told you that, if no one has grabbed you by the ear and made you stop for a minute and told you the rest of your life, you're going to look back on what you're experiencing right now. That Then that's me, right? I'm doing it. Yeah, this is okay? it. Okay. This is it. This is, this is your sign. This is me telling you, you are in your absolute prime right now. You will never be as tactically relevant as you are right now. The rest of your career, if you stay in the Air Force for 30 years, your relevance in the future as a senior, as a chief, as a command chief, your relevance will be based on what you're doing right now. Okay? So pour yourself into doing what you're you're experiencing right now and don't half-ass it because it's going to benefit you for all those years in the future. And by the way, when you're out of the Air Force... This is what you're going to look back on right now. And if yeah. you don't put 100% into it, you're going to regret that. But if you do, 
you'll be proud of it the rest of your life. For sure. Absolutely. Um, and I hope they heard me say that without sounding like the, you know, the old rambling lunatic that they think should just go back to the <laughs> VFW. Um, well, but- it's hard though, because, uh, you know, they, they, they can't see it like we, we do, you know, I mean, they, you know, they still have that vision like we did when we were there and it's like, it's just so hard to, to project yourself into the future. Like you want them to do, but it's needed to be said though, for sure. And I'm sure some of them took it to heart and, um, it probably, I mean, they might have, have all taken it to heart, but yeah, it's just, it's hard to put yourself, it's hard to think of it that way. Like right now you're just, you're doing what you're doing. Um, yeah. but I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you, um, brought that up to them because if you don't, because sometimes we, like you said, we just, we just keep plugging along and putting our head down and just keep charging forward. And, uh, we don't take a minute to take a breath and to just absorb it, you know, and just realize what the heck is going on, you know? Yeah. And that's, you know, um, I think you touched on this with Maddie as well, but it's a really interesting, um, experience that we all had. And other guys in the community have had these experiences as well. But, um, you know, there were, there were years, I mean, five, six, seven, eight consecutive years longer for some guys, uh, where we just never took our foot off the gas. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that impacts all of us differently. You know, some guys, uh, made it through it on, uns- uh, you know, without any issues, other guys maybe didn't, um, it, you know, but whatever, however it affected each of us, um, we, we wouldn't have done it any other way. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the unique part about that is you, you know, I'm, from my, from my experience, you and Maddie and Gav and Richie and Des and, and Ed and, and, and the list goes on and on and on. And that, and that's just air force tack peas, right? right? I could list off a, a list of hundreds of Rangers that we all know as well doing absolutely heroic things on a reoccurring basis. But we were all in the thick of it. So, so in the thick of it that somebody would come to the office and go, Hey, did you hear so-and-so just got into a massive gunfight and saved a bunch of people? And we go, I, that's okay. I mean, good for him. I'm about to leave for a two week trip to Marana right now. And I got a bunch of equipment that I've never even jumped out of a plane before. I'm, <laughs> yeah, trying to, exactly. I'm, I'm trying to get my shit in a sock here. And you're stopping me to tell me about something that someone else is doing. <laughs> right. And and it wasn't that we didn't care what our no, team not at all. were doing at all. Right. No. Nope. Like now, you know, you tell you, you bring a guy to me right now and say, hey, this is tech sergeant Smith. And he just did this heroic action. I would stop everything I'm doing and say, this, this deserves to be celebrated. Okay? Right. Tell me all and about we, it. You give me all the details. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I want to tell everyone I know what you did because I'm so proud of, of what you did. Right. Right. Um, but it's just where it, it's just that unique time where like, man, none of us had, you know, I, I would hear, you know, even our commander and our SEL of the, of the 17th at the time would, uh, you know, be going out to the OLs to celebrate other guys getting silver stars and bronze stars. And, and and I didn't even know what they had done. And I'm like, I don't have time to even listen to what they were doing, man. I'm, I'm just trying to get ready for the next deployment because if I don't, I'm the one that's going to suffer for it. Right. And my team is, you know, right. if I go on the next deployment and you always heard those horror stories about, you know, the one time that one tack piece screwed something up and, and my goal was always to never be that guy, right? <laughs> yeah, right. And you know, and I don't want to talk negatively about anyone. You know, some of those same stories that mm-hmm. that I had heard, especially being on team two. Yeah. Um, but you know, it wasn't that I didn't care what anyone else was doing. I did. And I and now I look back and I'm like, my God, I, I think I didn't realize how um heroic some of the things that guys to my left and right were doing. Some of it I saw firsthand, I'll tell you about. Um, but it's just that we, we had our foot on the gas the entire time. Right. Um, and, and if we didn't, and we showed up for that deployment and we weren't ready in a, in a life or death situation. And the team said, how do you not know how to do this? And I said, 
oh, well, sorry, you know, that what I should have been rehearsing this, but instead I was at a, a, an award ceremony right, on right. the last the, uh, on the last training cycle, or I, I, I missed that class because I was around talking about what someone else was doing yeah. instead of focusing on what I was doing. It sounds, it sounds on the surface and to the, to the layman, it sounds kind of selfish or maybe self-centered or callous, but, but it's, we're not like, I, just to kind of, and I, I don't want to sneaky repeat what you just said, but to me, it was like, I, I think that's great. But man, I like you said, I gotta I gotta focus on what I'm doing. Otherwise, I'm gonna screw it up. You know, I gotta keep. I can't deviate from my from what I'm doing uh, because I, I like you said, I want to make sure that I do it correctly. I want to I want to do everything right. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can remember a situation. You might recall this. This is an example of what I mean, and I'm I'm just gonna use me as an example. I'm not saying that anything I've ever done has been right but I can only effectively speak on my own experiences. Right? Sure. I try to limit it to that. Right. Um, <clears throat> I can remember when I first got to team two and John was the team leader. Yep. And John was a very demanding team leader to work for. Uh, but the remarkable thing was at the time, I can tell you without an absolute doubt um, that team two was the most squared away team for that period of time that John was in charge because we, I mean, he wrote us hard. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and of course we all complained that, you know, that's what we did. You know, you sure. complain while you're packing your ruck. You know, I think I put this in some of my notes for you. Every, even the hardest sons of bitches you've ever met in your life, the hardest Rangers in the world. We're all complaining like a bunch of kids as we're packing our ruck. But as soon as that ruck goes on your back, it's zip it. Yep. Nobody complains about anything because once the mission starts, everybody knows that's toxic, man. Right. One guy starts complaining, everyone starts complaining and no one's ever going to do that. So, you know, we all bitched in the, in the, in the locker room when we're getting our stuff ready. But as soon as it was time to get our shit on, it stopped because, yep. and, and what that takes is that takes a, 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 a controlled amount of emotional discipline. Sure. OK, I don't think anyone ever talked to us back then about emotional discipline. No, that was never a class we got, by nope. the way. But we all did it. OK, like if I was if I was the SEL of the 17th again right now, that's probably something that I would introduce as one of my you know, leadership discussions is emotional discipline. OK, there's emotional intelligence. People talk about that in the business world. Yeah. But there's a difference. Emotional intelligence is being aware of your emotions while right. you're doing business. Emotional discipline is being aware of your emotions and having the discipline to turn them off when need be. That's right. OK, yep. uh, because there's a time and a place for all of that. Yeah. Um, but we all had that, you know, and some guys would later in life might tell you that had an effect on them. But I think if you can harness that effectively, it can be liberating. Sure. It's, it's amazing what it can do for you. Um, but the reason why I bring that up is, you know, when we talk about pouring ourselves into everything, I can be, I can remember being on team two as a, I was an E5 or E6 and I was doing everything the team was doing. Right. Because that was the right thing to do. Yep. And by the way, I was brand new on a wrecking team. So I felt like these guys know how to do things. I don't know how to do. And I, you know, I, that can't be right. Cause that, that's how we were like now, if I was mentoring a TAC P or, or a, a air force guy in a recce team, I would actually tell them there's no way you're ever going to know how to do everything, man. You're just, you're not, you haven't spent 10 years as an infantryman leading up to this. Like they have, you're never exactly. going to know everything. But at the time I felt compelled to be as good at everything as they were. Yeah. So if it, if they were going to a machine gun range, I'm like, I'm going to the machine gun range. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm probably going to go over and try to sweet talk the armor into letting me get my hands on an M240 Bravo the day prior so I could practice malfunctions and loading before I ever went out there so I didn't look like a chooch. Right. <laughs> right. Um, we're going to go to a, a, a photography class. Well, I'm going to get on YouTube and start learning things about 
uh, DSLRs in advance so I at least can speak the language. Like the amount of time we spent on that was yeah. nuts. <clears throat> but at one point, I had gone completely non-current as a JTAC. And I remember there was there was some cast. I don't know if it was local or it was in TDY. And John was not wrong at all. He said, hey, we're going to a uh, KD range. We're going to a known distance uh, we're going to bring out range, yeah. systems. Yeah. And we're going to go shoot. And there was Cass and I was like conflicting. So I'm like, I don't know what to do today. Like I, I'm, my cast skills are probably perishing by the way, even though I think I was pretty switched on then. Yeah. Um, they were probably atrophying without me realizing it. And I was non-current, but I'm like, we have rifle systems on this recce team that I don't know how to shoot. And I feel like I need to know how to shoot everything. I need to know how to shoot the 300 win and the SR 25 and the Barrett, mm -hmm. which I probably didn't need to know how, but I, it was something that I didn't know how to do. Yeah. And I can remember at one point you and Brandy driving out to the range and, and basically going to bat with JC over where I needed to be at the time. <laughs> and and, you know, at the time I felt like a shit bag. Yeah. Cause I'm like, oh my God, I've got my flight. I think Brandy was the op soup at the time and you were the flight chief. I was like, oh my God, what have, what have I done? I've got the flight chief and the op soup out here engaging with the, with my army team leader. And you all knew each other like really oh, yeah. well, by the way. Yeah, it's real not, tight. It's real not tight like it was some weird conversation. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I felt like I was creating some shitbag situation where I was doing something wrong, right? Now, if I look back on that and I'm like, my God, at that time, it was like Master Sergeant Brandenburg and Master Sergeant Welsh having a conversation with Sergeant First Class John. I, I, I've lost track of John a little bit, by the way. I'm not sure if he's in... Um, still, so I'm uh, preserve his last for sure. Name. But, yep. You know, I got these three tier one senior NCOs talking about where me as an NCO should be at the time. Like, if I saw that happening now, I would say that's probably one of the most important conversations happening in the military at any given moment because we're talking about an NCO who's so committed to what they're doing that you've got senior NCOs trying to determine where his priorities should fall based on what he has coming in. Okay. Right. Like, my God, that's what, from a leadership perspective, that's as good as it gets. Yeah. Nobody was spending any time talking about like, we got to, we got to motivate this guy. We yeah. got to get him going. How do we convince him that he should want to do more or, it was, it was, you know, for all of us, it was nonstop. Right. We, we, you know, probably the hardest thing was trying to figure out, you know, where, where to point us. It was just yep. like this, this rocket that never lost thrust. It's so and funny you, you say that. But if I, you're I, not I, pointed in the right direction, it's never going to stop. Right. I said this, I, I brought up two things. I, to, I brought up that very same thing. And I can't remember if I was talking to Maddie or Mark. But I was like, when that when I was in that flight, I didn't have to tell you guys, I didn't have to motivate anyone. You guys were just like, you, I had to like, I had to stop you from doing things. Like I was like, you know, I felt, I always equated to like, and not, this is not a demeaning thing, but like it is if you had like some pit bulls on chains, you know, and I'm just trying to like, you guys wanted to do every single thing. And I had to like, you know, I had to, um, like you said, I had to sometimes, and I, I, I talked to Brandy, I think about this or somebody else, but sometimes it takes a guy. And yeah, we happen to be above you at that time, but it sometimes it just takes a peer or a buddy to be like, Hey dude, you should probably be doing something else right now. You know, that it happened to me, it happened to Brandy, it happened to all, it happens to all of us. And that was just that situation where, you know, you know, because at the end of the day, you are the JTAC. So probably having, being the best at that is a little more, you know, would be better than, you know, knowing how to shoot the Barrett. I think that's where we were coming from at the time, oh, yeah. but Absolutely. I, but I loved it. I loved every, I never, I don't think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I was mad. I don't think I was like, what the hell are you doing out yeah. here? I was probably like, this is so cool that you're, you know, that you're want to do this, but we also have to do, you know, I need you to be good at this too. You know? Yeah. I never, I don't remember ever getting like, 
I just, I, I, like I said, it was, it was the easiest leadership position I'd ever been in because I, everybody wanted to do everything. And it was, you were just like, yeah, yeah, it was awesome. And, and, you know, it wasn't just what we were doing for each other as well. It was what, you know, it was the way our families were intertwined yeah. as well. When I went back the 17th, the second time, I was just talking to somebody about this last night about what it means to be a part of a tribe. Yeah. Um, and all the war fighting aside, um, one of the things I'm most proud of is how close all of us were, um, back then. Yeah. You know, it didn't, it didn't, you know, when you and Maddie were talking about you covering down on one of Maddie's deployments for him. And I can remember that by the way, um, like that, that's the kind of stuff that most other people, men, women will never experience. Um, right. And it wasn't just the deployments and the um, training as well, but it was the way our families were there for each other. Also, when I was at the 17th, the second time, you know, one of the guy, one of the flight chiefs that was there, um, he was on a TDY when his wife was um, very pregnant. And um, we had talked about it before he went on the TDY. And I did ask him, like, do you think she's going to give birth early. And he said, no, it's not her first kid. And she went full term last time. So I said, all right. And so he went TDY. Famous last called, words. Yeah. He, yeah, he called me, it was a Sunday night and he called me and said, um, Hey, I just want to let you know, um, that my wife is having some back pain and Amber was pregnant at the same time also, by the way, and they yeah. lived right around the corner from us in Midland. And I said, all right, well, what, what do you need from me? He said, nothing. I told her to stop being dramatic and take a hot bath. I said, okay, no problem. And I, I went to bed and like an hour later, Amber, you know, she's like super pregnant too. She wakes me up throwing my pants and shirt at me. She goes, put your clothes on and go pick so-and-so up. She's in labor. And I said, oh my, okay. You know, so without asking questions, I, I'm just you know, half awake. It's like, you know, probably 11 o'clock at night now. And I'm driving like 90 miles an hour. I'm calling her husband. I'm like, bro, what is going on? He said, okay, I got this one wrong, but I'm TDY to Arizona right now. And she is most definitely having this baby right now. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, I got in the house and she is in the kitchen uh, you know, having contractions and clearly, you know, in episodic pain. And she's a nurse, by the way. So she's very aware of what's going on. Yeah. And they had a, 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 a son who was, you know, uh, a couple, uh, probably a year, or 18 months old at that point also. And I said, well, get in the car. And I, I, you know, we started driving to the hospital right away and we're halfway there. She's a nurse. She said, I'm not going to make it to the hospital. You need to detour to St. Francis now. And so, you know, we hauled ass in there, but here we are running into the hospital in the middle of the night and I've got his kid and with her and she's into the labor and delivery room. And like every five minutes, someone's coming out. They're like, sir, you should really come in. You're going to miss this. I'm like, no, no, I, I <laughs> should not go in there. I'm not the husband. Um, I'm just the, I'm just the guy who drove her here. So, you know, then the 17th, you know, all the wives started networking and another wife showed up like 10 minutes later and luckily ran into the delivery room before she gave birth and was FaceTiming her husband on the phone. And so I'm in the waiting room with their son. There's another wife in the delivery room while she's giving birth, FaceTiming her husband. And then another wife shows up and says, I'm here to take the first kid. So you back to the house for the next couple of days until dad gets home from TDY. You can go home now. And I'm like, okay, Roger that. The wives have got it. Um, it's like, you know, three o'clock in the morning now. I'm going home. But that's that's the other side. That's the backside to a tribe. Yeah, is when sure. you know, and and show me a civilian community where that happens. Yeah, you know, show me where you know operator number one. You know, his his wife is giving birth, and and just it's this sequence where you know I pick her up and take her to the hospital. My wife is calling the other wives. Another wife shows up and is in the room, and another wife shows up and takes the kid and. 
and just on and on. And um, I, I, I think I don't think it occurs to like entities like that, like civilian entities. I think they're just like, well, this is my business. You know, they just I, I don't think it and, and no fault of theirs. You know, I right. just I, it's not their culture. Right? It's not it's they I'm sure there's some, you know, there's some businesses or some places that maybe mirror that in some way. But yeah, for the most part, it's like, well, no, that's this is your business. You figure it out, you know, call your parents or. Um, but yeah, it's that uh, level of trust. Right. When, Am when Amber had um, our son, you know, just keep the names off of here for kids um, sure. on Fort Benning. Um, it was a, a similar experience, actually, with our daughter, as you know, Amber labored all day, yeah. you know, but with our son, it was like emergency. I mean, we were driving to the hospital and like six minutes after we arrived at the hospital, he was out. It was nuts. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but it all happened so fast. I was in the like in the uh, uh, hospital room with our daughter, who was only 15 months at the time. And I called one of the other guys in the 17th and I'm like, you know, we, we knew them and his wife and kids as well. I said, dude, this is crazy. This is all happening so fast. I need you to come pick our daughter up and figure out what to do with her because we don't have any family here. Right. And he, he, I, I messaged him like an hour later. I'm like, where have you been, dude? I need help. And he's like, I've been stand, I've been standing outside the delivery room for the last 56 minutes waiting to receive the package. And he's, <laughs> he's literally like standing in the hallway. He's like, I heard the whole delivery, by the way. I've, I've been out here the whole time. I didn't want to interrupt, but he was basically standing at parade rest in the hallway <laughs> the entire time. And I eventually walked out there and handed him our daughter. And I'm like, I'll, I'll call you when we're done here. And he said, take your time, man. We'll yeah. figure it out. And he just took our daughter home for a couple of days until some family got into town. And that was Justin, who's still in, who's still active duty. Oh, okay. Um, you know, who just took our daughter and, and went off. But that level of trust, you don't just hang your kid to random people. Sure. Um, but I love it, man. It's so important. But yeah. Hey, listen, I've been rambling for 40 minutes and I'll keep going for hours if you let me. But, no, that's what I want, man. Um, yeah, I want to hear all about it. Well, let's let's focus a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I think... I think people would be interested in hearing your beginnings. Like I, like I talked to the thing I loved about, and we talked about this on a couple different shows, but um, it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter where you started. Some people start right off as a tech P some people, you know, got in the air force and did something different before they became a tech P. And I, it was just amazing to me, the amount of cross trainees in our flight and that were like, just had risen to a level well and above and beyond most people, you know? And um, so talk about that. Talk about how, what you did when you first came in and what made, what um, prompted you to switch over to tech P. Yep. Okay. I'm going to, I'll take it all the way back. Some of this, you might not even know. Be, and it's so you were, so you were, your parents got together. They, they had you. <laughs> then, oh, not just too far. Okay. Way back. Um <laughs> It's funny when you're, when you're active duty, sometimes you don't want to talk about certain things. Just, I think because we're all protecting our reputation, but it's like, as soon as you retire, you're a lot more willing to discuss, um, a lot of things, but, um, I'll, I'll move through some of this quickly, but it might be useful to somebody who, um, listens to this because it, you know, I learned a lot of lessons. Some of them at the time I was learning them, I didn't realize how important they were, but, you know, when I was in high school, it was pretty clear I was not going to, the resources were not available for me to go to college. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking at the military, um, talk, thought about joining the army. My, my um, parents wanted me to talk to all the branches, which was a good idea. And I landed on the air force, but no one in my family um, that I was close to had really served in the military. I had some uncles and grand uncles, but I didn't have any real mentorship from them about joining. So I was basically going in between cold conversations between me and a recruiter. And this yeah. was in the nineties. So it wasn't That's like I good. was, you know, researching things on the internet. And I just yeah. walked into a recruiter's office and I had some senior airman, you know, I still remember the guy's name, which is astounding. <laughs> um, and I assumed that everything he was telling me was exactly the truth. <laughs> um, We've all made that mistake. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I went in open general oh. and, um, 
when I was in basic training, there it was determined that I was going to be a um, crew, an F sixteen crew chief. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever knew that. And uh, uh, yeah, and so I finished basic training, and I went to Shepherd Air Force Base to be to for tech school. But I, I was eighteen. I had basically never left my hometown besides for some short vacations as a teenager. Right. And the truth was, I was I was going through some serious FOMO. Okay, at that time, I was 18. I was in tech school and all my friends were in college or they were back in our hometown. And and I, I just felt like I had made a mistake joining the Air Force. And yeah. I thought I had convinced myself that I was going to get out of the Air Force. I was on a four year um, contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, if you want to get out of the Air Force, you go talk to other guys who are getting out of the air force. And this was a terrible, terrible idea that I had. Yeah. And, um, so I started talking to basically shit bags that had gotten in a bunch of trouble and were getting discharged. And I said, how are you getting out of the air force early? And I had these guys telling me all the things they were doing. They're like, you know, I, 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 I get in fist fights. I'm intentionally, you know, um, failing tests. I, you know, I'm um, shoplifting from the BX. I mean, just this like totally dishonorable stuff. Right. Right. And, um, and so I started doing some of those things at 18. Like I started intentionally getting in a whole bunch of trouble mm -hmm. and I had a, I still, remember, I don't remember the guy's name. I wish I did. I should, I, if I could look this guy up, I would, but I had an MTL who was a master sergeant who called me into his office and said, Hey man, I think you're a good kid who's hanging around a bunch of bad apples. And I think you're getting bad advice. You have convinced yourself that you want to get out of the Air Force. And the fastest way to do that is to get into a bunch of trouble. But you're not headed down the right path here, okay? Um, what you're doing is headed down a path where you're going to fail out of crew chief school and you're going to end up in some other career field. But it's not going to be what you want, all right? Yeah. And so in the middle of all of that, I was a poor airman, an airman. I was an E2. Um, and my grandma got really sick. And I got a Red Cross message to go back to New Jersey. And I didn't even have money to fly home to New Jersey. And they said, sign here that Air Force Aid Society is going to buy you um, a round trip plane ticket for you to go home and see your grandmother because you've received a Red Cross message. And I said, yes, um, of course. So I went home and when I came back, I said, okay, I got to see my grandma. Everything's good. Now let's get back to the part where I get out of the Air Force. And they said, well, that's not going to happen now because when you signed up that line, in addition to you being on a contract anyway, knucklehead, um, you're, you now owe the Air Force. It was like $50 a month, every month for 12 months to pay off the money that they loaned you for that plane ticket. Oh, I didn't okay. know it worked that way. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, me neither at the time. <laughs> yeah, and I was obviously, like, yeah. Oh, so what does that mean? They said, well, you were gone <laughs> for like 10 days. You've been cross trained, by the way, pack your shit. Um, you're going back to Lackland to go to tech school to be air transportation, which is like an even lower um, um, test score than, than crew chief. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I was like, okay. But here's the interesting thing. Um, I can vividly remember that was a critical moment. And, you, and we all have a few of these in our life. I was only 18, but it was still set into me um, that when I was on my way to Lackland, what, what I had thought was um, nobody here knows anything about me. Okay. They only, they're only going to know what I tell them when I show up. Right. And so if I'm negative and I, and I give them a sob story and I, and I get into a bunch of trouble there, that's, that's what the perception they're going to have of me. But if I show up and I just work my ass off uh, and I try my hardest, that's the way they're going to see me as well. And so I just, I, and I realized at that point, I'm not getting out of the Air Force, so I might as well make the best of it, right? Which, by the way, is, should have been my attitude from day one, okay? But none of us are perfect. And so when I showed up, that's what I did. I just absolutely crushed everything they put in front of me. And that's when I got really into fitness. And I, you know, every time we would go out to do PT, I just was obsessed with finishing first. I had to finish every, everything first. And, 
you know, any training objective they gave us, I had to be the best at it. Or at least if I wasn't the best, I had to try my absolute hardest at being the best. Right. Um, and so I did. I finished the tech school. I went on. My first base was Yokota, Japan, which was great. I made a lot of friends I still talk to. My second base was Osan, Korea, which also I still talk to a lot of those guys as well. But, you know, moving forward now, I was in Osan on 9-11. It was the middle of the night there um, at when, when um, you know, 9-11 happened. <clears throat> and I was also a senior airman at that point, And I was in my cross training window. And, you know, you only have a couple, a couple of weeks, really, to decide if you want to cross train. Yeah. And every, it was really heavy on everyone. And everyone had a very uh, uh, patriotic mindset then. And I, just like everyone else, said, I want to go fight. You know, but right. it was clear to me that I wasn't going to drive a K loader to the front to the flop. OK, right. <laughs> so I needed to be in a different career field. But I didn't know anything even then about the Air Force, really, certainly not about this sort of, uh, you know, uh, special operations or special tactics or tact piece out of the Air Force. So I asked my supervisor, who was a staff sergeant at the time. His name was Steve Miller, by the way. You'll hey. like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Better liner. And uh I said, what I told him was, I want to, I want to shoot bad guys. How do I do that? And he said, um, I guess you could be security forces. They get guns. I was like, that's what I, that's what I'm going to do. I need to be security forces. So I went down, to, I went down to, um, I guess it was MPF then. And I'm yeah. like, I want to fill out my cross training package and I want to be security forces. And they're like, okay, no problem. And I was headed down that path for a couple of weeks and it was Steve Miller. He goes, Hey, I heard about this thing called TACPA. <laughs> Appar apparently, they're like security forces, but with the army. So you're probably a much higher likelihood to see bad guys if you're with the army than you are with the Air Force. But these TACPA guys get guns also. And I'm like, okay, that, that that's what I want to do. I need to be, I need to be that. TACPA. And I start I started asking around, and somebody said, you know, there's tack peas right here in Korea. You ought to you ought to talk to some of them. I'm like, are you kidding me? I want to talk to all of them right now. Right. And one of them was Hank House. Okay. And who who, by the way, at the time was finishing up his time in Korea and going back to Fort Benning. You might remember that. It was 2002. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You could probably connect the dots and remember when he came back. Oh my right? gosh, I forgot about that. Yeah. And I and like Hank House like opened up my mind hole because he's like, yeah, dude, not only can you, you know, work with the army controlling airstrikes, but if you're really good and you try really hard, you can do it on the special operations side, too. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's exactly what I want to do. And by the way, I, I had nobody had, was talking to me then about, uh, you know, CCT or PJ or Sal T. Um, which, you know, who knows how it would have turned out if I knew all about all of that then, but sure. no regrets about the path I went down. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what he had told me was Fort Benning has the most training opportunities. Airborne school is there. Ranger school is there. Pathfinder school is there. And so I went to MPF and said, I want to be attack P and I want to go to Fort Benning. And sure as shit, I got an assignment and they said, you're going to Fort Benning and you can't start attack P tech school for like nine months after um, you leave Korea. So you're going to go to Fort Benning and you're going to be there for six months before you go to tech school. And I said, okay. So I spent my first six months at Fort Benning, not even as a tack P. I wasn't, I hadn't even been to Oh, tech I remember. School, you know? I remember because uh, just not to cut you off, but the I, it feels like a good time to bring this up. Uh, Mark Mark mentioned the same thing. He was at the fifth ASOS for like six months before he went to school. But I remember, I think the first time I ever met you or had any interaction with you, we were at Camp Shelby and we were up on the tower and uh, we we're all controlling cast. I was like this uh, a senior guy and uh, you were just sitting there not doing anything. I'm like, hey, why don't you jump on the mic? And you're like, and nobody said anything. I don't know. If, I, nobody said anything at all. And they're and you're like, OK. And you got on there and you didn't you didn't know anything. You couldn't do anything. I'm like, what is wrong with you, dude? Like, how how do you not know anything about this? You're like, I, I haven't even been to tech school yet. I'm like, ah, I feel like <laughs> such an ass. I was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, all right. And then it was like teaching time or whatever. But yeah, I felt so bad because I, I didn't even know that was a thing. I, I was like, yeah. oh, you're here. You must be fully trained, whatever. 
I have some pictures of that trip, by the way. Oh yeah, Maddie, Maddie was there. Uh, there was a couple of other guys there as well, but but yeah, but listen, those six months were, um, you know, my my approach then. By the way, it's still today was, um, I I have to absolutely prove myself in these six months because I'm coming back here after right. tech school. Okay. And I want, I don't want these guys dreading me, me coming back. I want them looking forward sure. to me coming back. So, um, but it wasn't like I just showed up and you and the other guys were sitting around doing nothing. You guys were all between combat deployments, right? Like you guys were just like, you know, in my eyes, just like, you know, salty combat Rambos. I'm like, <laughs> Oh my, these guys have seen war, man. <laughs> Um, and little did I know within a few years, I'd be right in the mix with all of you, you know? Right. Uh, but I did, I went off to tech school and even when I was at tech school, you know, um, uh, my, my approach was always, and, and it went on to all the way when I was in ROC and all the way when I was a chief in the space force, right? My okay. approach was always, um, I'm never going to be, um, the smartest guy, right? I, I might not be the best guy, uh, but I'm absolutely never going to let anyone outwork me. Right. Okay. No one will ever work harder than me at anything I do. Okay. Yep. No one will ever say Kevin didn't try his hardest um, in this situation. Um, yeah. I never and, saw, I mean, I can vouch for that. You, yeah. And, and you that, definitely... that was, that was my approach. You know, if we were, you know, if we were taking a PT test, like I was going to be puking when I finished, when I crossed the finish line, because I was pushing my body so absolutely hard that my body was going to start fighting into survival mode. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and years later, what, what we would see is um, there were things that we did training events and combat missions where um, you couldn't um, necessarily physically try that hard. Uh, but you know, when you were doing like an MLAT on a recce team, um, it took everything inside of you to do that. Mm -hmm. Like the amount of preparation that went into that and the amount of um, um, it, it, it would take everything. You know, you can remember when you got done doing like a 25,000 foot hey ho, um, most of us would go back to the and by the way, you woke up early to do it, but it wasn't just about the sleep. You would yeah. get done doing it and you would go back to your bunk and sleep for like six hours afterwards. Right. And it wasn't, Exhausting. Just, it wasn't just because you woke up at two o'clock in the morning to do it. It was because you were so absolutely, completely, emotionally, physically, cognitively, probably spiritually right. switched on. And if you are in that um, level of commitment and discipline for even 10 minutes, 20 minutes, it can physically tax you. For sure. But when you are in that headspace, when you're in the zone like that for several hours in a row, uh, it can take you just as long, if not longer to recover from it. Yeah. Okay. Guys talk about, you know, coming back from a firefight. Um, you know, and you and I can have had experiences where you come back from a really intense mission. Maybe it was a firefight. Maybe it was a hey ho. And everyone on the team is perfectly fine going to the chow hall and having a meal and not saying a single word to each other. <laughs> right. And going back to the bunkhouse and everybody cleaning up and going to bed and maybe even not talking to each other the next day. And there's nothing wrong with it. And nobody's ever say. This is weird. Why isn't anyone talking? Because, man, everyone is just like cooling down and decompressing. And eventually we'll cut, we'll get back to talking and we'll get ourselves back in gear and keep on going. Um, but it's very taxing to experience that. Now, do that over and over and over again for seven years straight. Right. That's what we all lived. So yeah. when I finished tech school, you know, I came back and within months deployed to Kuwait and then did the initial uh, invasion of Iraq with third ID. Mm -hmm. And when I came back from that, I, I basically hopped on the coattails of Matt Green and everyone else who was jumping over from 
conventional to the special operations side at Fort Benning and work my ass off to get over there. And within a year, I was in B flight and, and I, and I was deploying with third bat and did that for three consecutive years, nonstop. Mm -hmm. And then hopped on the coattails of, of you and Brandy and Maddie again, and went over to a flight and went on to team two and then went on three consecutive years nonstop after coming off of third bat, which is when I was coming off of conventional. Um, and it just went on and on. And so basically, you know, when I cross trained to tack P it was absolute pedal to the metal for like the next not, uh, uh, eight years nonstop until I finally left Fort Benning and went down to Hurlburt field where I was an instructor. Yeah. And truthfully, you know, what I probably needed was a, was a mentor then to, to help me sort my life out because you can, uh, you know, without going into my personal experiences, like, man, things weren't great. And on a personal perspective, yeah. when I left Fort Benning and that should have been my prime, that should have been where it's like, dude, you just finished eight absolute nonstop years where you did seven combat deployments in eight years and now whew, you're at the beach this is where it gets good but right, in reality right. that's like when my personal life started falling apart and i and i was coping with uh you know eight non-stop years of combat it as an instructor yeah. and i was you know probably a uh, very uh demanding instructor on young guys that were going to go fight as well and I had a lot to learn about myself then, which I did. Mm -hmm. um, but man, it was it was a good time, great time, demanding time, yeah. formidable time. Um, I, I wouldn't change it, but what I would do if I could go back and and grab myself by the ear is I probably would have said, um, "Hey, no one's going to walk into your office and say I'd like to mentor you today." <laughs> Right. And if they did, I'd say, get out of here, you nut job. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, it's like that old King of Queens episode. You know, I used to watch that show where Arthur decides he, he needs to start chronicling his wisdom and he starts, uh, <laughs> you know, telling people that they're here by his protege. Um, <laughs> and it just wouldn't have happened. Nah. Um, but the re what I would tell myself back then is I would grab myself and say, you need to go find a mentor and ask them. You need to ask someone to let you talk out loud and listen to everything you're saying, everything you've just experienced, everything you're going through now and where you want to be in one, three, five years, because you need someone outside of your own head who can help you sort these things out. It's not that you're not capable of it. You're just, you're biased. You're, you're, you're you. Right. you. You only know what is right, what you've experienced and what's right in front of you. Exactly it takes somebody right. else to come in and say, Hey man, you're forgetting about all this other stuff. And that's yes. why I'm here. Yes. Wait, as a senior NCO, did you ever have, this happened to me a couple of times. Did you ever have a Lieutenant come in and ask that very thing? I've had a couple of times that lieutenants would come into my office and be like, Hey, I need a, I need a mentor or I need you. Would you mind, you know, mentoring me in this? And, and I'm, uh, I didn't even know that was a thing, but I guess, I, I don't know if it's, if it's hard and fast rule or whatever, but yeah, these, um, a couple, it happened a couple of times and I was just like, sure. Yeah. What do you need to know? And I would tell them, you know, and basically it was breaking down kind of like what you're saying. Like they're, they have their, their little narrow path that they're focusing on. And then I'm like, Hey, don't forget about all this stuff that you're not even thinking about. So. That did happen. Here's here's a, two experiences with that. When I went back to the 17th as an E8, I showed up as an E8 select and then was promoted into E8, and I did three more years there um, as the op soup and the soup. Mm -hmm. um, I did have young CGOs come in and talk to me, but the difference is there, much like all the enlisted guys as well, those are the absolute best officers in the military. Right. Okay. So I didn't have young captains coming in and asking me, you know, how do I, how do I get the men to do what needs to be done? It was, right. you know, 
occasionally like, hey, I'm butting heads with my flight chief, who's a senior NCO. I'm coming to you in private to ask if you have any recommendations on how maybe I can be more effective as a command team, right? Yep. And and those were good, great conversations to have. And I would tell them like, yeah, you're basically, you're everybody here is a is a type A meat eater. Right. I mean, it. This is a very difficult place to lead because, it. You know, it's like. Uh, well, you know, to I I think it's a, it's a difficult place to lead if you're trying to lead. If you're trying to, if you think you want, you have to be actively, uh, an active leader. And like it, this is that's not the place for it, especially for an officer, because it, I think it's different now. I think the officers that are coming in there now are kind of equal as far as like experiences and stuff. But when we were there, it was like we were the subject matter experts and guys yeah. would come in and they would know they were great at what they used to do, like fly an F-16 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but they needed out like it was th- anybody that would try to like be too aggressively a too aggressive leader would just kind of be met with resistance because like, yes. stop. I got it, man. I know what, exactly what to do. I don't need you telling me all this other stuff. So that's right. Yeah. Um, and, but then late years later, you know, not too many, but a few years later, I ended up in the space force. Right. Um, which was not really anyone's plan. I just happened to have PCS and the position I was in flipped to space force. And then, all of a sudden I was a senior enlisted leader in the space force for my last two years. Right. Nice. Um, and that's okay. I enjoyed that. Um, but there I did have often young officers coming in, um, actually even squadron commanders come in and ask me for recommendations, uh, leadership recommendations on how to connect with their formations and be more effective. And I even had officers come in and ask, how to be more effective with senior officers. And I thought those are great conversations too. But for sure, one of the things I tried to remind everyone is, hey, it's a duty and responsibility of a senior NCO to mentor and develop young officers. For sure. It is. Yep. Now, the, enl- the enlisted force structure does not say that it's a duty and responsibility of senior NCOs to mentor and develop senior officers. It doesn't say that. Right. But I will tell you the best senior officers I've worked for are still willing to be mentored and developed by their senior NCOs, even though it doesn't say that they're supposed to be. Right. Okay. When I was in the Space Force, some of the best officers I think I worked for um, who were in the Space Force, now still serving in the Space Force, would seek counsel from senior NCOs. And one of the reasons is they would say, hey, you know, the liberating thing about having a conversation with the E9 is they're not jockeying for promotion. That's right. They're certainly not competing with me for a future promotion. That's and right. so I get a much different conversation out of them than if I asked another general officer who's going to be competing for a future promotion with me. Yep. It's considerably more candid yes. when you get it from an when you get it from E9 than than a peer or so. yeah, for sure. That's exactly right. And so yeah. but those are critical conversations. I always took those um, as very important whenever someone asked me. Uh, to participate in one of those. Yeah. Let's go back to um, when you got to, when you first got to third ID Yeah. Um, and talk about that initial push in Iraq, because I know like you, Maddie, um, you know, meet Fairchild, Des, yeah. all these, all you dudes before you even came to B flight were getting, getting after it in Iraq. So um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Tell me about the, the train or like the spin up and, and that kind of thing. Um, I didn't, we can, we'll talk about that and then move past it probably because it wasn't as eventful as it was for other guys. I had no spin up when I finished tech school. I came back from tech school immediately because I was an E, uh, I was a staff sergeant and I had not been to ALS. Okay. Um, they said, Hey, you have to immediately go to ALS. So I got back from tech school and like, Four weeks later, went out to Robbins Air Force Base to go to ALS for six weeks. And while I was in ALS, everybody deployed to Kuwait. Oh, I did not know that. Damn it. And so when I got back from ALS, the only guy who did not deploy at the time was Josh C., who had a baby on the way, uh, like final couple weeks. And I got back and he was there. He's like, well, pack your it again because now you're going over to Kuwait. Everyone's already there. And uh, and so off I went and everyone was already living in FOBs 
in Kuwait for like a month at that point. Um, and so I fell right into the brigade headquarters where it was Maddie, uh, Jim Fairchild, me, a, a guy named Eric, Tech Sergeant Eric R. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Vegas was the other ALO's call sign. Oh, right, right. Um, who, was, who was great. And so, uh, you know, I think we, uh, you know, it's been a, it's been a while, but I think we spent f- between three and six weeks, something like that there waiting until we crossed the border into Iraq and then uh, off we went. So I was with talk, talk two and I wasn't even a JTAC then or ETAC then I yeah. had just finished tech school um, and went to ALS. That was it, you know, and I had like <laughs> the leftover equipment because all the guys who had deployed got all the good. Right, right. And even the stuff that they had wasn't great. So I had like, <laughs> exactly. you know, and I think I had an AR or um, um, what did they call them? The non M4 or GAU. I had a GAU, GAU 5, five. That's GAU right. GAU yeah. 5 with a carrying handle. <laughs> no optic. It, no optic. You know, <laughs> like other guys had a flashlight on the front of theirs. And I was like, yeah. oh, they're so tactical. I don't even have, <laughs> I don't even have a flashlight. And occasionally someone had an aim point at the top. I'm like, he's basically a sniper. <laughs> right. You know, um, I had a flak jacket, a helmet yeah. with, you know, it was just terrible, man. It's probably um, K-Pods back then still. K-Pods, I mean, that's yeah. right. So I was with Talk 2, so I wasn't even near the, the front, man, honestly. Uh, but we still drove up all the way through Western Iraq, all the way, you know, I plotted it all in my atlas at one point. Oh, okay. Um, through the Karbala Gap and up the west side of Baghdad and into um, into Baghdad and and then you know that I think that took about six or eight weeks and then eventually we redeployed back to Kuwait, rehabbed all our equipment and then uh, went back to Fort Benning, which is where I you know almost immediately did everything I could possibly do to get over to um, Third Bat. Which, uh, you know, my my saving grace was I was given the opportunity to deploy as an augmentee when I got back. That's how, you know, right time, right place. And you hear a lot of guys say that's 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 a a pretty common theme. Oh, for sure. Because I wanted to go and there was really no formal assessment back then. And you may have even remember, you, you know, you may have been on the side of the fence that made these decisions at the time. But. Somebody had asked me, do you want to deploy as an augmentee only, which means when you come back, you're right back to third ID. Yeah. Um, but Seco 375 uh, needs an ETAC at Organ E for this deployment. And by the way, they already left for the deployment and you're going to show up two weeks into it. And I was like, yes, That's, I had just gotten my, e- like I was a brand new ETAC. I'm like, That's exactly what I want to do. And so same shit, I showed up to Oregon E late, just like I showed up to the, you know, Kuwait late. I was always late. <laughs> and again, I had all the leftover equipment because everyone else had gotten all the good stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it was winter time, by the way, in Oregon oh. E, which is, and you've been there. It's like, yeah. dude, you're at like 8,000 feet in the middle of Afghanistan. It's, it's literally survival mode and they're right. living in the mud huts. Yeah. And, and, you know, Donnie was our supply guy. I went back. I'm like, I need all the cold weather gear. He's like, I have this bright blue mountain hardware jacket that everyone else refused to take because it's not tactical. And I've got these <laughs> mittens. And it was just like miscellaneous stuff. I'm like, I'll take it all. Yeah. And and when I showed up in Oregon, e, you know, I flew into Bagram and I think it was Mark picked me up and you know, got me on a helicopter and got me down to Oregon E and I showed up and uh, some E5 Ranger, by the way, I'm going to connect some dots here for you. Okay. Um, showed up at the HLZ. This was 2004. So Oregon E was not built out then. Right. Which was awesome. It was like, man, I wish I could go back there now. <laughs> it's probably all level now. Yeah. But he showed up and he's like, you're, you're supposed to live with me. I'm like, who are you in charge? He's like, I'm in charge of my team. He's a, he was a sergeant in E5, right? And he's like, I'm in charge of my team, but they said some Air Force guy is here and I'm the only one that has an extra bunk. So you're staying with me. It's the middle of the night. 
I was like, I think you're supposed to take me to see the company commander. He's like, you'll see him tomorrow. Just get your shit. <laughs> like nobody was interested that I was there at all, you know? And so he took me back and I went in his room and he was an E5 Ranger team leader. And he had like three like privates living in this mud hut. And he's like, that's your bunk over there. And they got just went back to playing video games. It was a very unceremonious yeah. arrival. And yeah. I just went to my bunk and started prepping my gear in case the big mish came down, you know? Right, right. And the next morning I walked around until I found one of the doors that said CO and I knocked on it and said, Hey, I think I'm here. I'm your company ETAC. And again, they're like, that's great. You got a place to sleep. Yeah, cool. We'll let you know when there's a mission. Like nobody was impressed, you know, but yeah. I was just concentrated on being but this ready is your first, anything. this is your first thing. Yeah. And you're like, you're ready to get after it. And meanwhile, these guys have been at war for three years, you know. Yes. So and yeah. I was late and they had already been there. And you know, even two weeks into a ranger deployment, people already have like a, a daily battle rhythm. And right. And uh so anyway, let me fast, you know, I'll let you slow me down here in a minute. But what I want to point out is <laughs> I was an E5. That team leader was an E5 at the time, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I just retired, as you know, as a chief. And that that E5 team leader is now the command sergeant major of 1st Ranger Battalion. And I just went out to his change of responsibility uh, a couple of weeks ago in Hunter. And since that deployment, he just, he just got back from his 20th combat deployment, by the way. Crazy. Jeez. Uh, Silver Star recipient and just an absolute gunslinger. Yeah, yeah. Um, we always stayed in touch. E fives, E six, seven, eight, nine. When I was stationed in Peterson, I lived on Fort Carson. He was stationed at Fort Carson. We lived really? next to each other as E nines in Colorado, and we and we <laughs> loved it. We're like, dude, we were E fives living in a mud hut in Oregon E together in two thousand four, and now sixteen years later, we're E nines together in Colorado. And we would literally come home from work where I was a space force Delta SEL and he was a army uh, brigade SEL. And we would literally come home, pour a whiskey and talk about our days and how we could, you know, help each other as, as, uh, as SELs. And it's just, and, and we still talk, I mean, we FaceTime each other and, and um, just stay in touch, but uh, you know, just like you and I do as well. And, you know, you never know where a lifelong relationship is going to start, whether it's at a, uh, you know, cast tower on Camp Shelby uh, or in a mud hut in Afghanistan. Right. You know, that's another thing I would grab myself by the ear as a young guy and say, don't discount these collisions that right. you're going to have throughout your career, because some of them are going to be lifelong friendships. Yep. Some of these guys you're going to rely on in a firefight. Some of these guys you're going to rely on when your wife is in labor and you have don't know what to do with your kid. Some of these guys you're going to rely on in the future when you just finish your seventh combat deployment and your life is falling apart and your marriage is crumbling and you're going through a divorce. Some of these guys you're going to rely on when you retire one day and you don't have a tribe anymore and you're drifting a little bit and you need someone to bring you back in. Okay. That's that's the it, that's the uh, criticality of these collisions that you're going to have throughout your career. I think I'm fortunate enough that now I'm able to look back on those and see where those happen. And if I have done a shitty job of staying in touch with those guys, I'm now at the point in my life where I have the willingness to reach out to them and say, "Hey, man, I've done a shit job of keeping in touch for the last ten years, but I love." to just hop on zoom and have a beer and yeah. get caught up. Um, but it's so important, man. And I'm sure that you have those, uh, events that you can look back on as well. Those yeah. times, those people. Yeah. Yeah. It's totally right. I mean, even if it's just for one or two times you brush with, uh, these dudes and, and they have such an impact. Yeah, you're right. And it's not, you know, and some like you and I have, I mean, you and I have a remarkable amount of career, Time. By the way, I still think today that you have signed and written more of my EPRs than anybody else. I think oh, I, really? I have like five or six or seven EPRs that you 
sign, like when yeah. I was in third bat and then RRC. Yeah, and, then yeah. at, and then at headquarters as well. Yeah. I mean, we spend a lot of time together, man. That crew like, so is much uh, time. It's, so much time. But there's, uh, you know, there are other guys that you and I keep in touch with who we didn't have as much time with, but we may have had intense events with. For sure. That bond us. Yep. You know, um, when I was with Third Bat, I was on, you know, a, a particular mission. You know, you, I've told you about it, the ambush in Iraq, you know. Yeah, go um, go for it. Tell me about it. And, yeah, um, but I'll, I'll talk about it. But the, the, where I was going with it initially was, you know, like there were, you know, like two or three silver stars in one day, 10 or 12 purple hearts off of in that same day, 10 or 12 bronze stars with valor, myself included in that one day. Yeah, that was such an intense day of firefighting where still a lot of us stay in touch who may not have had a lot of other career experience together otherwise. Right. But we all have that one day in common. And that one day was so formidable for all of us. Um, and we equally shared it that we stay in touch with each other years later. You yeah, know? for sure. Um, you, you know, at one point. Um, and I, 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 I'll go through it quickly, but then talk about the importance of it. Um, what we did that day with third bat in Western Iraq, um, was the Marines. We were in uh shark base in Ramadi and it was, uh, the summer of 2005. And that was basically the place to be. Mm-hmm. And the joint task force was running, um, high value targets and, um, any, missions that were not um, tier one targets, we would then turn over to the vanilla seals who were on the other side of shark base at the time. uh, And they task force bruiser and they would go out and execute them. Okay. And that's not to discount anything that they did in that same period of time, because they were doing very important work as well. Oh, for sure. The majority of it was missions that the task force, frankly, wouldn't launch on. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the, at, at that time, the Marines were going on a uh, clearance operation through a portion of Ramadi that had not been patrolled in months. And it was well known that a lot of bad guys had repopulated that area because Fallujah had just uh, the Battle of Fallujah had just uh, uh, come to a close, which was a major event. Yeah. Uh, and Ramadi was becoming a, a, a beehive of bad guys. And so yeah, it was that's a too big long deal. to leave a place like that. Uh, yeah, you, can, you can't I mean, leave it ungoverned. You right. know? And so what we had coordinated was that uh, the JTF was going to uh, set up a blocking position on the other side of the clearance operation where there was a river with a single bridge going over it because. The, the assumption was if there's any bad guys in town that are leaving during the clearance operation, the only way out of town, if they don't want to come in contact with the Marines, is to go over that bridge. That's the only way out. And so we took a company of rangers out there, the Joint Task Force. We had other attachments with us as well. And we set up the day prior. OK, we walk, you know, we went in. By helicopters, walked for like an entire period of darkness and set up. And uh, sure thing, the plan was a success. And almost immediately, as soon as they began, we we had set up a blocking position on the bridge with interpreters. I love um, the story. And, and it was a perfect, the, the road was a perfect dog led going down to the bridge. Yeah. And, and, and the uh, road was built up. And so it was elevated. Uh, with ditches on both sides and on the Uh other side of the ditches, which were also elevated of equal height to the uh, road was all cornfields. Okay. Okay. And so you could very easily, which we did hide in the cornfields, which were a couple meters away from the road. And you had no idea driving on the road. You just thought it was ditches on the side. Right. And so we had a block, we had a sawhorse with a sign on it that said, you know, this road is temporarily closed. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, the first car of the day pulled up. And so we sent an interpreter out and we sent a couple of 
uh, task force guys out. And as soon as they went onto the road, this car immediately opened fire at the uh, got our guys, unknown to them that there was, an, you know, 45 Rangers in the cornfield <laughs> yeah. who all, with without exception, simultaneously shot this car. Okay, so imagine what an entire, you know, uh, 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 a company minus of Ranger firepower simultaneously firing into a single car a few meters away looks and sounds like, right? Uh, needless to say, every, every, all the entire threat was eliminated immediately. Um, but what we realized when we went up to SSE this, um, and you know, you've heard this part of the story before, um, you know, these, as, as we were pulling the, um, combatants out of the vehicle, uh, one of their cell phones started ringing and the interpreter at the time. It was a guy from Cal grew up in Iraq and then moved to California, spoke perfect, um, spoke the language perfectly. He, he held the phone up to the commander at the time. I still talked to that commander, by the way, and said, kind of jokingly, do you want to answer this? And he said, yes, I want you to answer that. See who's on the other line. And so he did. And they had a very you know how those guys communicate. They're, you know, yelling and having an exciting conversation. And and when he hung up, he said, "What? so what was that all about? And he said, this guy, these guys apparently know each other and they're all bad guys. And he said, what happened? What? I just heard a bunch of shooting. Tell me what's going on. And I told him, yeah, I was leaving the city and I encountered a bunch of Marines down by the river. But don't worry, I shot them all. And we're stopped down by the bridge right now. What should we do? And that guy said, stay there. I'm going to send more fighters to your position so that you can keep fighting the Marines. Okay. Stay by the bridge. Um, there's, I'm going to send another car with four guys down. And we said, okay. Now, years later, I, I thought about this, by the way. This is basically a, a legacy feint. OK, from a yeah. from a from a doctrinal war fighting perspective, this is this is a classic feint uh, with modern technology. We were using right. cell phones. Um, and so, you know, I had uh, attack aviation and F-18s uh, overhead at the time. And I'm on a couple meters away from this road and I'm sharing all this with them. I'm like, uh, we're trying to get this car off the road because we got intel that there's going to be another car coming down. So start <laughs> scanning this road and let me know if anybody's coming down the road. And they started doing it. And, you know, Rangers went up and pushed this car off the road into a ditch so you couldn't see it when you were driving down the road. And this is all in a short period of time. And then I have aircraft telling us, yes, we have a sedan coming down this dirt road at a high rate of speed. And we, there are things sticking out of every window. and We think that they're weapons and we're like, oh man, this is unbelievable. This cannot, this is, this can't be happening. So, you know, everybody is told, Hey, get into your fighting positions. Uh, this is going to be a hasty ambush. As soon as this vehicle stops at that sign, if we identify vehicles, that's the trigger. And, um, and so they did, they pulled up, it was a sedan. These guys had rifles sticking out of every window. And as soon as they stopped at that sign, we immediately engaged, myself included, that vehicle. What was remarkable, I don't know how this happened still, four guys. Imagine 45 people shooting at a vehicle three meters away from them. These guys did like an Austin Powers 27-point turn on this road, <laughs> turned the car around, and drove the opposite direction. <laughs> okay, they were probably how alive. how how was because forget about the road, them being alive. How was the car even operational? You know, I guess I know. Listen, <laughs> because the road was on ditches, they couldn't just make a U turn. They were like doing these little curves <laughs> to keep it from going off the road. Okay, and so oh. this car starts going in the other direction, and we're like, "This is unbelievable. We cannot let this car get away from us." Right. So. You know, again, it's just like unbelievable events the entire day. So a uh, Gustav team, the commander says, hey, goose the car. So a Gustav team runs out into the road 
This car is getting as fast as he can drive away. The gunner sits Indian style on the road, gets the goose off on his shoulder. The guy loads it and gives him, you know, taps him to shoot. He shoots the first round. It goes right over the top of this, oh. uh, barely a miss. And as they're reloading, one of the guys in the car has just got his AK out of the window backwards, just spraying. Right. He rips around right into the groin of the goose gunner. Who's no sitting way. In the Hits him right in the groin. Now he's laid out on the road. Okay. Oh. Uh, never they didn't get a second round off. And almost immediately the car at that point, I think all these guys were hit multiple times. Yeah. At yeah. that point, it went off the road. The car went off the road into a ditch. Okay. So now we've got a casualty. Um, and the problem with that was now we got a car in a ditch, and um two of those guys got out of the car and were now in the cornfields. Okay, so now you've got unaccounted personnel who are walking around. Sure. Um, and so they sent Ranger teams out online, stepping one foot at a time through these cornfields looking for these guys. Okay. Um, and the remarkable thing is one of the one of those guys is still in the army now. He's a CSM. His name is Kirk. This was his first of two silver stars, by the way, an absolute warfighter. Um, yeah. He and his team were walking one step at a time, and they came up on one of those guys who had gotten out of the car. Okay, and that guy was basically, you know, on his way out. Yeah. But yeah. when he saw them, he stood up, pulled a hand grenade, and ran towards them. And Kirk grabbed the dude and took him to the ground and took the grenade in the chest. Oh my god. Okay? Um, and so everybody hears this grenade go off and we're like, what is going on? And it's some, you know, private on the, back then privates didn't have radios, right? It's a private on his team leader radio. And he's like, uh, Sergeant so-and-so just jumped on a hand grenade. What should we do now? We're like, <laughs> is he alive? We're like, yeah, he's alive. He's having a hard time hearing. We're like, Bring him to the medic. That's what you should do. It, yes. Eliminate the threat and bring him to the medic. And Just so, to clarify, he had body armor on, obviously. Yeah, body armor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The other, the the uh, the the enemy combatant did not survive that, obviously. Obviously. Okay? Yeah. Now this is such a ranger mentality. Oh. Okay. I'm with the CP, and I got the medic next to me. I got the the um, RTO next to me. The commander. The FSO. And we're sitting there, and we had just all finished shooting this car too, so we're all hyped up and reloading magazines and in in comes this guy who just took a hand grenade in the chest and he's a little you know shocked and he's having a hard time hearing and uh the commander right away to the medic he's like take all take everything off and make sure that he's okay and the medic is looking over him and he's he's like lay down lay down and he's talking loud because he's he can't hear well right and uh the medic gets his sear, scissors out we're wearing ACUs at the time uh -huh. and he goes to cut his uniform off just to check him. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, no, 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 no. Don't cut my, cut my uniform. Why? What are you talking about? I need to check you to make sure you're not, you don't have any injuries from that hand grenade. He goes, you can't cut it. The, the deployment packing list said, bring <laughs> the deployment packing list said, bring three uniforms. And I only brought two and the other one is in laundry. If you cut this one off of me, I won't have another uniform and I'll get in trouble. That's so Ranger, man. And he's saying it so loud Ranger. because he just, his eardrums are basically blowing out. Right. And he's like, I think, I think you're going to be okay, man. You just jumped on a hand grenade. Okay. <laughs> we'll get and you some got, more. He's got like shrapnel in his throat. Oh from my God. Jumping on a hand grenade. And he's worried about the fact that he doesn't have all the items on the packing list. Like that's like. It's just not, it wasn't a big thing to him. Yeah, he yeah. He couldn't appreciate what he had just done, you know? Right. And, and at the same time, by the way, you know, the next vehicle that came in, we, we shot up and we, we had to get that uh, vehicle off the same road because cars kept coming all yeah. day. Bad guys, cars full of bad guys kept coming. From but the phone, right? The, the turp, yeah, they through the call phone. Back, the turp would call to talk to him. Yes, and every yeah. time the guy would call and he'd say, what's going on? And 
you know, for, for, for multiple cars in a row, the interpreter we had was like, things are going great. We're all, we're, everybody's <laughs> linking up. Okay. At one point, you know, let me, let me, um, back up for just a minute. The next car that came in after we had shot it up, we had to get the car off the road because got people wouldn't come all the way into the kill zone if they saw another car sitting there shot up. Sure. Um, and, and the next car, although everyone had been sufficiently engaged, uh, the driver was still squirming. Okay. He was basically at that point, it was just nerves moving his yeah. body, but, um, the, the commander to, you know, is his risk to buy. He said, I don't want anyone up there pushing that car. Cause there was a very real VBIED threat in that part of Iraq at the time. Sure. He said, I don't want anybody pushing that car until everyone and all the occupants stop moving. Okay. Because if there's a switch in that car that could be hit, I, I can't allow anyone to go up there if there's yeah, a chance sure. that, that guy could hit it. Right. It's, a, yeah, it's for sure. reasonable. Yeah. And so we went back and forth and we, you know, at the same time, we got guys jumping on hand grenades. We got guys getting shot in the groin. Like there's a lot going on. Right. And the platoon sergeant at the time, Colin, you know, who was like a burden of ship kind of guy then and even now, you know, he's at going back and forth at some Colin point, B. Yeah, Colin B. Yeah. He's, you know, to the company commander, he's like, all right, sir, we've talked about this enough. And he just walked out of the cornfield, walked through the ditch, walked right up to the window and put a magazine into this guy sitting in the driver's seat, reloaded, pulled the guy out onto the ground and said, sir, there's no moving occupants in a vehicle. Give me a squad to push this vehicle off the road now. And <laughs> off it went. That sounds, you know, that sounds got like silver, him. He got a silver star for that as well. And so, oh, really? you know, this, you know, things calmed down for a few minutes um, after all of that. Now we got a guy who had just been shot in the groin. He was bleeding out pretty good. He's sucking on a fentanyl lollipop. They're, you know, doing significant um, casualty care to him. We brought in um, um, uh, medevac for him and, and we carried himself, myself included, carried him on a stretcher out to that helicopter and got him out of there. Um, and, you know, by the time all of that settled down, the intel kept coming, the phone kept ringing, right? Like the, the narrative kept getting better. And then, you know, where I finally, besides, you know, shooting my own, my gun, what every JTAC, ETAC that really wants to do is drop. Sure. Um, the phone kept ringing. And the, the Terp at that point had convinced this guy who was basically in charge of all the bad guys there you know, the local uh, team leader that we had, what he had told him was we had captured a Marine at that point and oh said, we have continued to battle the Marines down by the river. And at this point we had captured one. Okay. Who in is reality, this who can, has this great imagination, you know, I know. In, <laughs> in reality, um, what it, it was us ambushing these cars all day. Okay. Yeah. And, and we were taking casualties. They were taking casualties. We were, medevacking guys out. We were jumping on hand grenades, but he had convinced him that the whole time the bad guys were winning and we captured a Marine. So he said, listen, um, I, it, it was a couple of phone calls back and forth. He said, I'm going to send a camera crew down to the river and I want you to cut that Marine's head off oh and we're going to get it on video. Um, I'm going to put the camera crew in the back of an ambulance and I'm going to tell them, turn the lights on so they can get through the city while the Marines are clearing it. OK, but when the ambulance gets to your position, you'll know it's the camera crew in the back um, and you know what to do when they get there. Right. And so I share this with all the aircraft in the stack. I said, hey, continue scanning the, the um, route into our position. But we have intel that there could potentially be an ambulance with its lights on headed our way. And if we do, uh, the commander has declared it um, hostile. And sure thing, it was it was a Marine um, uh, AH-1, UH-1 combo. Nice. And they said, no, it, this was all during the day, by the way. They said, no shit, with our naked eye, we can see an ambulance with its lights on <laughs> headed down the dirt road directly to your position. And we're like, all right, let's, let's, let's hit it. So 
uh, what we ended up doing was coordinating a hellfire strike on it. And before it even made it to our position, they came in with a low altitude hellfire strike. Perfect. Um, I saw the video afterwards and, and it came right in the back doors of the ambulance and just split this thing in half. Jeez. And um, at that point, the cat was out of the bag on what had really been going on all yeah, day. Yeah. And uh, we, I can't believe you know, it went on for that long. I mean, that's, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, I'm talking like, you, you know, if we had just been sitting there all day, we would have had a better plan on how to take care of ourselves. But because it was basically an all day gunfight, nobody took the time to think about things like, are we drinking water? Are right. we putting sunscreen on? Are we eating? Nobody was doing that. But by by like sunset, when things were finally settling down emotionally and physically, as we were talking about before, everybody was like absolutely spent. And yeah. everybody was, I, I have pictures that a couple of pictures were snapped on that day that I have. Um, and I look back and I'm, we were all incredibly bright red sunburn oh, because we were out in, in Western Iraq all day in the summertime, <laughs> super dehydrated. Our lips are all chapped because nobody was drinking water all day. Um, and you know, it just was like this series of events where the only thing on your mind was killing bad guys. Right. Right. You, you didn't know? think and about like, the other stuff. Yeah. You didn't think about anything else until things finally settled down. And then you realize, oh man, everybody needs to eat, reload, drink water. And, and at that point, the Marines had finished their clearance operation and we all went back, but, uh, <laughs> really exciting day, really great day. But it's one of those formidable days where, you know, I still keep in touch with Kirk and I and I keep in touch with the other guys that day, um, although I may not have had a lot of other career experience with them. That was such an intense day that we all shared together um, that that, uh, you know, we stay in touch and we have a, a sort of bond over that uh, one exciting day. Yeah, for sure. That's it's, that I heard. I read. I I texted you before um, a while ago. I read that in a book somewhere. Somebody had written about it, and I'm like, "That's that story Kevin was telling me about." Like, I don't know who it was. He's probably some guy that was there. But, Could have been. Yeah, that's such an amazing story. I mean, the fact that it went on that long, and they just kept falling for it. Like, you had medevacs coming in, and they're like, "Eh, no big deal." Yeah, <laughs> it's just amazing, man. Yeah, I think there's one more thing I want to talk about while you, at your battalion time before we go to ROC. But there was a, t did you, didn't you guys take down or yeah, did something with an IED factory? Yes, that was actually same um, location uh, out of Shark Base because of the rotations we were on. You know, if you got stuck on a particular deployment schedule, it's like you were always deployed during the same months every year for several years in a row. Right. And so I did summer of 05 in Ramadi. And then I also did summer of 06 in Ramadi. Wow. And so when we were back there again, um, also at a shark base, um, we were running so many missions at that point. It was just so infested with bad guys. Yeah. Um, we were, we, you know, I remember at the end of that deployment, that was a 90 day deployment. And I remember at one point somebody counted. And we had ran 100 direct action missions in 90 days, which meant there were days where we were running more than one mission a day. Right. And it was not uncommon for us to go out on a nighttime raid, um, take um, um, individuals off the objective. And when we would go back to shark base and go to sleep and they would interrogate them, Intel would wake us up and say, hey, we have intel that their colleagues are still in the city, but they know what's going on and they're going to leave in the next period of darkness. So wake so up. You got to get going back yeah. on. You got to go back out. And so, you know, it's like an entire task force of guys who have been asleep for two or three hours and they would just go door to door and say, wake up, you're going back out. And in, you know, the matter, in the matter of minutes everybody is just like, you know, hammering rippets, walking back out to the strikers, not even sure what we're, where we're going or what we're doing, getting GRGs on the way. Yeah. And off we go to hit another target, you know, or other times where we would hit an objective at night 
and get intel for a follow-on and off we went into a daytime objective in the same city right which is risky because um you know everyone's been already up for an extended period of time but at, you know by the time we got halfway through the deployment we were basically every nighttime raid we went on we planned on being out for a follow-on so the strikers were loaded down with extra mres extra rippets extra everything because yeah. we just expected that we were going to be hitting objective after objective. Yep. Um, and that, it was the absolute prime for all of us, by the way. I mean, I was JTAC and, you know, uh, the Army JTAC program had just started at that point. So, you know, um, uh, Woody was my Army counterpart um, at that time. I mean, okay. we were dropping so many bombs in Ramadi at that time. I can remember Woody and I, there were 500 numbered buildings in Ramadi and we had made 509 lines for every single one of the buildings and made a book out of it. And we had sent it to the jock and told them any aircraft responding to a troops in contact in Ramadi should have the, the Ramadi JTF nine line book <laughs> because we could open it up and know, Hey, that's building number 327. Turn to turn to nine line number three hundred and twenty seven. Read back lines four and six. Okay, that because it was just that active. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, one of the missions was there. You know, I, I've looked at the map fondly years later, but <laughs> there was a railroad on the south side of Ramadi that cut off the south end of Ramadi with a road that paralleled the railroad. And they called that baseline road. That was the baseline. And nobody, you know, much like the summer before, nobody had patrolled south of baseline um, in an extended period of time. They were only patrolling north of it. Right. And so there were there were only a few houses and compounds south of baseline road. Uh, but anybody who was a bad guy was hanging out south of that road. Uh, and so we had substantial intel that one of those compounds was being used as an IED factory. They were bringing in explosives and in, you know, in the square compound, which was probably like a half an acre big, and it was all walled with gates. Um, they were manufacturing IEDs and then people would pull in in trucks, they would load them up and they would go and ship them out around the rest of the city um, that were being used to attack uh, the Marines that occupied um, Ramadi at that time and the JTF that was running ops there as well. Yeah. And so, um, we set up in strikers in a graveyard, uh, a couple kilometers away from that IED factory. And we stayed there forward staged for hours while we had CAS in a stack overhead and ISR developing it. And we were watching it on, um, uh, ISR feed at the time as well. And eventually the commander made the decision that, uh, we were going to, uh, raid it. And so, uh, we did, and we went, you know, gaff to the X, the strikers pulled all the way up to the wall, uh, put a striker right through the gates and, you know, Rangers and attachments as well, including OGA and, and some other, um, organizations as well, just, dismounted into an immediate firefight uh, with bad guys that were in the courtyard. Um, and uh, the JTF neutralized everybody in the courtyard without, without friendly casualties immediately. And nice. so we secured all of it and in, you know, immediately identified that it was in fact an IED factory. And we had videos and pictures of it that were taken for evidence later of a you know, massive amount of HME homemade explosives that were being um, made there and other explosives as well. But while we were in there for several hours, we started taking fire from the surrounding buildings um, and some of them very close. Yeah. Uh, and so it was an exciting day to be a, uh, a, a JTAC at that point. Uh, Woody was there, Woody and I, because, you know, we were the we were the the main attraction in Ramadi at that point because we were doing a JTF daytime raid on an IED factory and had just finished troops in contact. So we basically had every aircraft in the area nice. and we started taking fire from surrounding buildings. 
And while we're working up nine lines, I, I, I forget the guy's name now, but big, actually, um, big Samoan Ranger saw gunner and, and, and Rangers are in the compound returning fire at the surrounding buildings in, in almost every direction yeah. while we're working up nine lines and a uh, big Samoan Ranger. He was probably six feet tall, but he was standing on like a, a heap of garbage over the wall dumping nut sacks out of his saw <laughs> right. into the surrounding building. And I was on a knee at ground level working up nine lines. And when I looked up at him, I remember he looked like he was, he, he probably was nine feet higher than me, but he looked like a God. At that <laughs> you know, he, he looked like he was 90 feet higher than me. And, and he caught around right through the calf. Oh man. In and out. But I thought, you know, and I and I had already, you know, literally watched other rangers jump on hang jump on hand grenades. And so, you know, I was a new new tack P to the Ranger Regiment then. So I but I knew how hard everyone, but I watched this guy take a round right through the duck and he looked down and just changed his drum and kept returning fire. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> this is the hardest guy I've ever seen in my life. You know, late later. You know, he he took the time to get dressed up on that, but sure. um, but after the commander saw him take around, he's like, "Drop every every building we're taking fire from is fair game," and that's not to um, sound dismissive of um, you know any anything that was going on at that time, but you can remember back then um, that's you know that was a risk based decision. If you yeah. were in if you were in a courtyard. And you were surrounded, taking fire from all directions, and you knew that you had to leave that courtyard and you were going to have to fight your way out to get back to your home base. Um, the, at that point, you could not accept any unnecessary risk if you were already taking casualties. Right. And right. so the decision to eliminate all the surrounding buildings uh, was valid at that time. But for JTAC, that was exciting because we had all the nine lines already done. You just like so execute number or whatever. Immediately start to execute. But one of the buildings was so close. It was like 25 meters away from us. One of the buildings was so close that, you know, I determined I can't drop a bomb on this because if that bomb is off at all. And, and at that point, we were dropping bombs in Ramadi almost every day. And, you know, I talked to a lot of other guys who had similar experiences. But, you know, pilots were dropping every day then, too. Yeah, And so pilots were on their A game, but right. at that point, 50% of the bombs that I had dropped and the majority of them then were GBU 12s and 38s, which are GPS and laser guided 500 pound bombs. 50% of the bombs that I dropped were misses or duds. Okay. Jeez. And so here we are, uh, you know, prosecuting a target 25 meters away. And in my head, I'm thinking there's a 50% chance <laughs> This Jeez. bomb is either going to be a dud or a miss. And, and the it, miss could be on me. Like it's not miss could be on me. So the what I had the decision I had advised the commander on, which he ultimately bought, was we need to strafe this building first to make sure every we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna strafe and walk his strafe onto the target. And once he's on the target, then we're gonna attack it with a bomb. Okay. <sighs> Um, and so we did, it was F-16 strafe. I, somebody snapped a picture, by the way, which I still have of me, you know, I'm on a knee. I've with seen a wall, it. I've seen that picture. Wall, and the building is 25 meters on the other side. And I've got the ground, I've got the FSO, the commander next to me. I've got the RTO and everybody's, we're all watching this F-16 come in and right. they're asking, are you sure he's pointed at the target and not us? And, and I'm, I'm saying, you know, I'm literally pointing at the F-16 trying to determine, you know, <laughs> geometrically you right, know, right. If, if he's pointed at the wrong target. But when, when an aircraft is at, you know, even low level then 10,000 feet on a strafe run, how can you determine if his yeah. nose is pointed at you or a building 25 meters away from you? Yeah, it's almost impossible, you know, and so I had high confidence that he knew where we were. And and, you know, that's the kind of risk that we were all buying back then mm -hmm. where I said, hey, call 
call uh, uh, um, um, man, my terminology has gotten away from me. <laughs> yeah. uh, tally target and um, visual friendlies. Right, right. Okay. There you go. And once you've done that, I'm going to advise the commander to to for to pass clearance. And he said, "Hey, I'm visual friendlies, tally target, wings level, waiting for clearance." And we gave him cleared hot, and he hit, he hit the right target with strafe. Okay. Nice. Um, but that's, that's an exciting time when you see an air, you know, and other guys have been in much hairier situations than I have been, but you know, when you see an aircraft coming in, you're like, man, I hope, I hope that, you know, something's not wrong with the gun and one, even one or two rounds strays. Um, yeah. and so it wasn't, and he hit the target and luckily, you know, we were able to expel And What we did was we strafed that building enough times and with the others as well that after we exfilled, we then bombed those buildings once we were 300 meters away uh, because we could accept that risk a little more effectively then. Sure, sure. Um, but that was an exciting time uh, as well. That was a good and exciting time. And it was one of those formidable missions um, also, you know, because, you know, and I'll back up and I'll pour a little more on that. The FSO at the time, um, and I, I talked to him now he's, he's a Colonel in the army and he's, a uh, has done very well for himself. And there's, and he had his position and there was nothing wrong with it, but I was an E5 at the time and he was an O3. Um, and his opinion at the time as a career field artillery officer was, um, we should use, uh, GMLRS on these targets. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we had almost a little bit of a tiff in the middle of this firefight because he was advising the commander, sir, we need to clear the airspace and approve all of these targets to be struck by GMLRS because we can use an entire battery right now and have simultaneous effects on all of these buildings. Yeah. Okay. And he wasn't wrong about that, but my position was, if you clear the airspace now, everybody in the airspace is going to lose SA. Right. Okay. And we're hours into this mission at this point. And, and it, took, it takes that long to build enough SA that if an aircraft is on the tanker or he's in a turn where he can't see the objective, even in those positions, if I say, hey, we had individuals move from building 10 to 11 – he can still visualize and attack in an instant. Right. But if you take him off target for even 20 minutes for, for an artillery attack, it's going to take twice that to build SA. Yeah. Okay? And that ROS that you have to establish over for a Gimler shot, it's not just a little bitty, you know, it's like no, probably it's like five nautical miles. So it's easy to get a yeah, you got to push them all out. They can't be exactly. They got to. Yes, so it's, it's not, not a, it's not just a simple thing to do. No. And so we went back and forth. The two of us, basically, he, he was telling the ground commander, um, sir, clear, clear, cast off station, attack this with GMLRs. And I was saying, don't do that. We have aircraft at the IP with the nine lines ready to execute right now. I can have a, effects on target in 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, su at one point he said, you two figure this out. And we couldn't figure it out. <laughs> and eventually the, the commander said, we're going with Cass. Okay. I need effects now. And, See, after, and that's, that's a testament to you because that FSO is an army guy. The commander's right. an army guy. They've probably hang out together because they're, you know, they probably go to parties together and do all that stuff together. So that's a testament to you that he trusted you that much to go with what you were saying. You know what I mean? No hit on the FSO. He was doing the right thing. What he thought was the right thing, but you know, the, for the commander to trust you that much it speaks volumes about your relationship with them and the, then the job you were doing for that unit. So, yep. And like I said, that guy was an incredibly smart field artillery officer. I mean, sure. he, you know, he was a West point uh, field artillery guy. He, you know, we would go out on missions and take mortar fire and he, you know, he was like, he would, you know, he wasn't like an EOD guy. He was a field artillery officer. He would look at the impact still and go, oh, I can tell you what direction this came from, how big the mortar round was, how far away they were when they fired it. And I'm like, that's a yeah, the crater analysis, cr crater yeah. analysis. I'm like, this is nuts, man. He was such a smart guy. 
Um, and like I and said, his in doing, his defense, he, that that probably would have worked to to eliminate that particular threat. Yes. But if any other threat would have popped up, you would have had to conduct a bunch of work to get all those aircraft yep. back on station. More SA, yeah. So yep. But we had we did have some strained words later that day when we were back on Shark Base because. You know his his opinion was I'm an I'm an officer and I'm and I'm the FSO, yeah. I'm the one that advises the commander. You know, and my position was, I understand that, but I also feel like it's my responsibility as a as the as the JTAC to advise the commander on what all of his options are, and and allow him to make the best decision on what he wants, the effects that he wants. You know. Yeah. And so we. I, I mean, uh, in the way I look at it and this may or may not be right, but you're, I, I wouldn't say he's above you. I would say you guys have equal, equal roles in that position because yeah. like he, yes, he's an expert at what he does, but so are you. And I mean, I don't think any, I don't, I think you had just as much right to express your views on it as he did and had just as much clout. But the yeah. great thing is, you know, I'll bring this back around to what we first started talking about. The amazing thing is um, at that point, moment you know it was it was my third ranger deployment my second summer in ramadi and i had been on probably 80 missions in the last 60 days leading up to that yeah i was in my absolute without a doubt absolute prime as a yeah. jtac right then and right in your comfort F zone. Yeah. That that FSO was in the same prime. And that company commander was in the same prime. And that ranger who took a round through the calf and kept on shooting was in the same prime. Yeah. And so all of us were in our prime. And so having a little tiff over whether we're going to prosecute a target with GMLRS or, or F-16s is like basically a luxury argument because <laughs> right. we all had equal capability to destroy the enemy at that yeah. point. We were just arguing on who got to do it with <laughs> right. their toys. Yeah, yeah. Who who, <laughs> who presented the best argument. Right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Nobody <laughs> was panicking that we couldn't get out of the situation. All right. Everybody was like, no, yeah. this is that's what we're way. here to do. That's a good point. Let's do it. Yeah. It's not like, oh, man, we're really up against it. Are we ever going to make it out of here? It's like, all right, we're definitely going to make it out. And how are we going to do it? You know, and you had to kind of rock, right. paper, scissors for it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. But man, I appreciate you letting me tell these stories, which are probably, you know, at this point, 80% true. Right, right. Um, right. That's, still, that's pretty <laughs> good. That's a pretty good percentage. We talked a lot about battalion, but I want to hear some more about recce. Like I hear, you know, because the way, just from what, what you've said and kind of what we experienced, you had a really condensed um, timeline. Like from the time you... When you were in uh, a flight, third ID, from the time you left third ID and then went over to, to B flight and then made it to, uh, you know, battalion and then recce, that's a pretty condensed timeline. I mean, you did a lot of a lot of things in a very short amount of time, um, which is uh, that had to be like kind of you alluded to earlier. That was very um, just go, go, go the whole time. So tell me about that transition from when did you go from battalion to recce and then maybe tell me some things about recce. Yeah, it, it was, by the way, if you and I talk to a guy now who said, <clears throat> I'm going to become attack P and, uh, five years later, I'm going to be an ROC. <laughs> right. Crazy. He would probably say, keep dreaming. Dude. <laughs> exactly. Okay. You, it takes 10 years plus until mm -hmm. you're ready for that. But, um, you know, I think, you know, you, you, you could actually effectively probably share more of that, how that decision went, because there wasn't really an assessment back then. It was almost like invite only. Okay. Yeah. And it was you and Brandy who approached me about coming over to a flight. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you remember at first, the, I initially turned it down because I was, go I was gone like nine months a year for like four years straight. Yeah. And I was experiencing some pretty substantial um, marriage issues at the time. Right. 
Uh, and when I talked about it with her, it, the the response I got was, "There's if this means it's even going to stay the way it is now, let alone get worse from an ops tempo perspective, the answer is no. There's no way I'm willing to stick that out. Yeah. And so I had turned it down. Um, and then I stayed. But then later you guys reapproached me and I think you had explained how maybe we could take a little more control over the ops tempo and make it more bearable. Yeah. And then I did come over. So we tricked you. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> um, and, I'm, you know, I'm happy I did, actually. Of yeah. course. It's, yeah, it's yeah. one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, but, I, you know, would, would back then Master Sergeant Welsh and Master Sergeant Brandenburg have walked up to Staff Sergeant La Liberté and said, hey, you've only been attacked P for um, four years. We think you'd be a great candidate to come to ROC. The only reason why I think you guys did that was um, because I had just spent, I had just done four con combat deployments in four years. I had spent two back-to-back -back summers in Ramadi where I had been on a hundred missions in 90 days the year before. I was, you know, deploying live in close proximity deployment after deployment. Um, and that that much experience in that short a span of time um, makes someone an expert. Yeah. And so, you know, the real question when you're hiring anyone, even in a civilian organization is, you know, what kind of risk am I buying by bringing this person into my organization? You know, it's nice to think about what they're going to do when everything goes right. But what it's what's it, what is it going to be like when things go wrong with this guy? Right. But when somebody has proven themselves you know, for four years in a row, literally in combat, uh, you know, you're able to look at him and say, this, this guy has um, proved to us that he's low risk. And as long as he keeps doing what he's doing, everybody's going to win. Yeah. I mean, right. I've always been a big, uh, I've never been a big time guy, you know, like, um, and I know you keep saying four years, but you're not saying four years in the sense that, well, he's got four years of experience. It's like, in that four years, right. look at everything this guy has done, right? Like, I hate when people say, well, he's got 15 or 20 years in the Air Force. I'm like, well, I don't care. What did he do when he was in? You know, like, it has nothing right. to do with the time. I need I need results. I need, um, you know, uh, accomplishments. So that's why you were a no-brainer because we're like, look at this guy is crushing. And he's he's filling, meeting all the requirements, filling all the squares. Yeah, bring him over. Another thing that prompted my decision was every time I used to go to the range with you every time we ever did any kind of cast trip or whatever it was i always learned something i was always because i remember I, this particular one stands out i never knew what to do with my dagger and probably everybody did this i was probably only a knucklehead that didn't do it but that, i i don't think that's true you always had a like a smart way to like put your kit together that was easily accessible you know ways you could change the batteries really quickly you know stuff like that and i remember i looking at you i was like wow yeah that's a great idea. Put, I think you had it in the front or something. But like I said, I always learned something from you every time we went out because, and I think it, I think it had a lot to do with number one, you're a smart dude, but also guys like you, guys like Maddie, Mark, you know, guys that were cross trainees, they weren't burdened by those training scars that we all learned when we were old, you know, young conventional tech fees. You guys saw a problem and you fixed it. We were more kind yeah. of, we, sometimes we were constrained by, well, this is the way we used to do it. So this is the way we got it. But, uh, that's so it was a testament to way the way you thought, you know, very three dimensionally, very kind of outside the box. And yeah, that I, I used to learn yeah. from you all the time. No, that's a yeah. But two points on that one years later in my career and still today, I say this um, just because you've been doing something for a long time doesn't mean you're good at it. For sure. A hundred percent. Right. hundred like percent. Yeah. Years later, I would realize in the military, um, just because someone's been in the military for a long time doesn't mean they're a good leader. Right. It, it oh, just for sure. They haven't gotten out yet. Okay? Yeah, exactly. Um, so you're, to your point, exactly. The amount of experience that you can condense and garner into a short amount of time is remarkable if you keep your foot on the gas. But mm -hmm. also to your point, you know, it's funny now we can joke about it, but you say things like I would go out to the range and learn, um, you know, see the way you guys were setting up your kit. But for guys like me, we would go out to the range and go, I have to have my kit straight because guys like JD are coming out to the range today. And if my kit is not straight, I can't allow them to see me 
as a, you know, with with soup hanging out, you know, like it right, right. can't happen. But the other thing, you know, to, to answer your question um, about what that transition is like, I think one of the reasons why I did okay in recce is I had I had done so many missions with third bat because I was just in the right time at the right place for several deployments in a row um, that I was always using all my equipment on every yeah. mission. So right. I not only knew how to use all of my equipment to its maximum capability, but I was constantly changing the way my equipment was set up because, you know, I would go out on a mission and if I had to use my Islib and it, you know, it, because everything is always tied down, mm -hmm. you know, if the tie down got caught on my rifle in the process of turning and tearing, pulling it out, that meant when I got back the next day, I was going to have to change my gear because that could never happen again. Right. You know, or if there was a chance that when I pulled my rifle up to the ready, the strap got caught on a pouch and I wouldn't be able to return fire immediately. Well, that meant I had to take all my pouches off and, and then I had to set them all back up again and I had to do up drills. Like that's what, we, yeah. that's how in the zone we were is that, right. We would set our kid up, put ourselves through rehearsals, um, and then restructure. And by the way, if, if if something didn't work, if we got to the point where it didn't work, the next thing we started doing was we started tearing our kid apart and sewing it back together All in right. ways that it did work. Yep. And so guys like me and Maddie and Sean was a big guy on this. You know, we had like sewing needles and, and dental floss and wax thread. <laughs> and you know, sail right sewing machines, and yeah, we were yeah. making our own pouches, we were making our own racks, um, we were making our own body armor at one point, which is probably not allowed. <laughs> right, probably, right. You know, if somebody probably somebody knew we were doing that, they would have said, You can't make your own life sustaining equipment, but <laughs> we, we were the ones, but it was that, your like, life, you know, it's your guys' life. life. We're yeah. like, I'm gonna go fight bad guys. And the equipment that I had, which is the best equipment you could get, by the way, mm -hmm. right? We were we were the best in the best organizations with the best money at the time. Right. But it still didn't work. It didn't make sense for what we were doing. Then we had to modify it because if we were in a gunfight and we couldn't win, and we were and we thought for a minute, oh well, the win the reason why we're not winning this gunfight is because I have pouches and I knew that they were but I didn't take the time to modify them because I was afraid of what somebody was going to say. Right. Well, then we yeah, all lost. And so no we reason. Did, yeah, exactly. We did what we knew how to be done. We, we, we modified all of our equipment to make sure that we were ready for anything all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, good. But that also meant that we all had, all of our equipment was very personalized. Right. Okay. I which is kind of like a, it's that, which kind of goes against a uh, standard ranger tenant, which is, you know, standardization and, you know, everybody has the same kid, but, but at that point, I don't, I think they got, they were starting to get away from that, you know, like, yeah, in the eighties and the nineties, um, when you had to do, when you're setting up patrol bases and, you know, doing, uh, you know, you you put everybody's ruck in an MSS and you went out and yep. did the raid and then you come back and you just grab a ruck and go Ch times had changed since that, that point. So. Yeah. There are some there are some necessary things that you need to have standardized, like your like Brandy had mentioned before in a previous podcast. The uh, the med kit's always in the same place. That way, yeah. you, you know exactly where to get it. And right, yeah. like that was a non negotiable. Med kit was always the farthest left pouch. Right, right. Even for us, because if you run up on another ranger you, and you you use his equipment, to, his medical equipment to treat him, right. you always know where that is. But yeah, you're exactly right. Like. For everything else, I'm a right hand shooter, so my magazines need to be, you know, off the the off center on the left. But, you know, I've got an islet, I've got a dagger, I've got right. a laser rangefinder, I've got things that the infantry guys don't have, yep. but I have to have access. And the way we used to train back then, which was great, was, you know, I assumed that every every time I trained, I assumed um, I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be coordinating CAS in the future. Um, I'm training to coordinate CAS and I'm going to be under fire. It's going to be nighttime. Uh, I'm going to be in MVGs. Uh, so, something is going to fail. 
<laughs> right. on my equipment. No one else is going to be able to help me fix it because they're all going to be fighting on their own as well. Right. And I have to be able to return fire, fix whatever's wrong with my equipment and control CAS without any assistance at all. Yep. That was the mentality right. we had. I assumed that I was going to be giving clearance in the middle of shooting my gun and my radio was going to dump its fill and I'd have to pull my kick 13 out, fill the radio <laughs> again, get back up on comms and give and give it cleared hot without anybody around me knowing what had happened. Right. That's right. And so when we would go out to the range, even though you and all the other guys were there with me, if if my dagger batteries died or my radio um, dumped a fill, I wouldn't dare ask someone, even though you were there and could help me, I wouldn't go, oh, can you can you uh, fill my radio real quick? <laughs> yeah, no, it would. Yeah, you would never do that. Because yeah. I would expect that one of you guys would go, absolutely not, you shit bag. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. I can remember going to a range one time and Mark, while we were all controlling, it was me and Maddie and Richie. I can remember Mark walking circles around us, looking in our pouches and any equipment that was not tied down. <laughs> Mark was taking the equipment. He's like, just lost that. <laughs> just yes, oh, not right. dagger, not tied down. Just lost because you know, what's going to happen in combat. That's it's, gonna fall gonna... out of the pouch, and if it's not tied down, you'll lose it. Just lost that, and and, yep. taking, and and none of us would fight him on it. And we go, "Oh, give that back to me! Come on, this is training." We we would just go, probably yeah. embarrassed, yeah, like yeah. damn it, you are so embarrassed that yeah, you, yeah, that that happened. Yep. And then when we would debrief, it was like, oh my god, the humility. You, <laughs> right. you, you were just like embarrassed that somebody had your gear. Yep. Because you didn't do what you knew was right. But you would rather have it that way than somebody not talk, not not identifying a shortfall of yours. Because of and I, I've always said that I'm like, if I if we go out and do anything at all, whether it be control cast or shoot a flat range or whatever it is, and I'm not getting any feedback from anybody, it kind of pisses me off because I'm like, were you guys not paying attention? Yeah. You know, I you know, I'm I'm by far not perfect. So I need to have the feedback so I can keep continuing to hone my skills, get better. Yeah, I used to get upset Absolutely. when yeah, yep. I mean, before like when Jazz Erickson was there and Kenny Lindsay, and we they they had no problem in letting you know what you did wrong, and I and I loved it. I hated. I think I probably hated it at the time, but I mean, it eventually made me a better guy. Obviously, you know, a better JTAC. Yeah. So, yeah, Absolutely. you got to get that feedback, and you have to be you have to be receptive to the feedback as well. You can't just you know you have to you have to take it for what it is and not get your feelings hurt and and use it to get better. I mean, I think some yes. guys have problems with that. So, yep. But I think that aided in my transition to recce because that's a very autonomous environment, as you For know. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, my initial team leader, who was John, and then my, and at that time, the ATL was Casey, who ultimately became the team leader. And I still talk to him um, often as well. Yeah, another great um, guy. Um, I think they realized quickly that I could be, uh, I was new and I wasn't a recce guy, but. I could be counted on to do things um, the way I was told to do them the first yeah. time. Yeah. You know, when they gave me a packing list, they didn't have to worry about whether or not I was going to skimp on the packing list or forget my socks or, you know, whatever it was. Man, uh, I don't know about you, but I couldn't imagine when I first got to recce, I, I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine doing something different, like than what they said to do. Like, no. you, like you said, you know, nothing. So like, In if fact, they're like, Yeah. I, you know, this now I can look back at this and realize I think I was sharp enough at the time that some of the senior RRC guys at the time thought I had my shit together enough that they didn't need to really give me any direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Which can be might, bad too. Yeah. You might remember this. My first jump trip out to Marana, I had, I went through free fall school, got my, 30 free falls and jump number 31 was in Marana. Jeez. Okay. Which is like, as you know, that's like really diving into the deep end. Yeah. And, um, the team I was attached to at the time, the team leader was, um, Kurt T. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Who was a fantastic experienced guy, but he was oh, also awesome. like, he's so experienced. He was like laid back. Yeah. You know, 
And so we went up to do an equipment jump like on day two. And I had a size large PDB parachutist drop bag. Right. Okay. Which now nobody, I don't, I don't think anybody, I don't even think they make size large PDBs anymore. They yeah, make yeah. small and mediums because the large was like basically a bundle. <laughs> right. It, it was, re- I mean, it was so big. Yeah. When you pack this thing out, <laughs> it was wider than your body. And for a guy like me, who's not super tall, it was, I would sit it on the ground and I had like slack in my attachment straps, <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. But I remember asking Kurt, I'm like, Hey, all I've only jumped a rear mounted rucksack <laughs> in, <laughs> in, in free fall school at Yuma. <laughs> and I just got this thing issued. What do I do with it? He's like, don't, don't overthink it, man. Just load it up and jump it. I was like, Oh, okay. Do I need a class on, on this or anything? And he's like, Oh yeah. Come <laughs> over here. Look, you hook it up to your D rings. <laughs> it was, it, yeah. You that thing your, was actually a lot easier. I mean, frankly, if you, know. you knew how to jump it. Okay. For sure. He's, he's yeah. like, you hook it up to your D rings. You put your feet through the shoulder straps because it's upside down. And when you jump it, you keep it between your legs. That's it, man. Don't over- And by the way, just make sure it's um, heavy if it's big so it flies right. And I'm like, right. oh, at- no problem. <laughs> exactly how big should I make it? And exactly how, <laughs> how heavy should it be? Can you tell me exactly how many pounds? He's like, go figure it out. So, okay. So... I, I loaded this thing up with a, a bunch of miscellaneous, uni, you know, all the shit you can find in Marana right. and rocks. You know, guys are like throwing rock rocks in there, PDB <laughs> for weight. And what I had ultimately did, which was a terrible idea, was I had created this giant PDB. It's probably like 30 inches wide, 48 inches long. It's filled 99% with pillows that weigh nothing. Right. And then really heavy, like 20 pound rocks in like the corners. Okay. <laughs> and when I get in the air, aircraft, not distributed they, at all. They, not distributed at all. When we get in the <laughs> aircraft, I, I hook it up. I'm like, and by the way, everyone else on the team is a jump master with like 200 jumps. And I'm like an E5 on my 27th jump. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I hook it up. I'm like, is this, is this how much slack? Should be in. Should I make them tight? Should I keep them loose? What should I do? I'm like, stop overthinking it, man. Just keep it between your legs. I'm like, should I tighten up the the, the shoulder strap? Should I make them tight? And everybody was just like so comfortable in their own capabilities that I yeah. think they took for granted that I was not experienced. <laughs> what had happened was then, okay, and the DZSO by the way was Roy. Nice. Um, I jumped, you know, a Kodiak and when as the absolute instant I left the aircraft because I had all the straps and the shoulder straps loose and that thing was not weighted symmetrically, it immediately shifted to my side and sent me into a spin. Oh my God. <laughs> and I spun uncontrollably all the way down to pull altitude and I was spinning I mean, I was spinning so hard. I was struggling to pull my hand in to look at my altimeter to determine what altitude I was at. And oh eventually my God. at 4,000 4, feet, I pulled in a spin, fully expecting that I was going to go to reserve. And uh, I didn't. I had serious twists to kick out of. But when I hit the ground, I can remember Roy pulling up to me in the um, gator telling yeah. me, you were spinning so fast and, and it was so uh, uh, flat. We could see you with our naked eye from, from 12,000 feet spinning all the way to pull. Oh my God. Um, and, and, uh, and then finally, when we got back, all the senior guys were like, okay, Kevin, we're going to have a class on how to load the PDB and how to jump. And I'm like, I would really appreciate that. Um, you know, I wanted that before. Uh, yeah, I kind yeah, of asked for that. Better late than never. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know that that you know that um, was sort of my transition over. Was 
I think that I presented myself in such a way that most guys knew I was going to be a good teammate. Um, and oh, they just sure. gave me the training where they thought was needed. But ultimately, after that first training cycle, I ended up on team two, you know, and then moving through it a little quicker for the sake of time here. Um, I ended up doing three deployments with team two, um, just great training cycles, hard training cycles, yeah. um, you know, and, and when, you know, so many jumps and when you're, you know, and we did it all like, you know, I was the JTAC, but when we would go out to Marana, I was still doing everything the rest of the team was, I was, sure. I was doing 25,000 foot hay hoes, you know, with full combat equipment and, you know, with bundles in the stack and, and, um, you know, we were doing week long MLAT reccees and, you know, long deployments in yeah. Iraq and Afghanistan, where some of them we were doing real world reconnaissance. Um, and it was awesome, man. It was so good. Such a yeah. small team, great team. Um, and when you spend that much time on a small team, you know, that's seven guys. Right. And five of us had, uh, we're on four of us were on that same team the whole time. We had a couple guys come and leave throughout, but yeah. the core group of that team was together for three years and, and we all still talk to each other often. And I'm thankful for that. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, I, I always used to say uh, the training cycles were always much worse than combat. Like, I, yeah. man, I mean, it was just go, go, go all the time. And you barely had a chance to, you know, refit when you came back to Benning before you had to go back out and do something else again. And it was all different training. Uh, but then when you got to combat, it was like, uh, oh, you like let your hair down a little bit and kind of chill. And uh, and the yeah. recce side now, battalion was always like, oh, they were always go, go, go. But, um, I, but yeah, when you got to recce, exactly right. But that's because, um, because when we were home, we were trying to live some normal life, right? While we were quite literally, this is what was happening. Like we didn't know it at the time. We were decompressing from our last combat rotation while simultaneously preparing for our next combat rotation. Right. While we were trying to be a normal person with our spouses and children and churches and communities. And yep. the reality is we were not normal people. <laughs> right. Not by we were, which yeah. is why we very often then only felt comfortable around other guys going through the same stuff as us. Yeah. And actually it, now a lot of us, I can speak for myself very accurately. Um, I enjoy being around other people like me who have right those same experience as me. And it's not that I'm incapable of spending time with people who haven't gone through those things, but they haven't been through the same things. Like, you know, for example, you know, Amber. Yeah. You know, she tells me all the time, like, you are not a normal person. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's usually not, she's not saying that in a complimentary fashion. <laughs> right, right. When she says that, but she does understand that I am not normal. I'm okay right. with that. But she also understands that you're not normal. And, yeah. and that all the guys that you and I know are not normal also. And she is proud of and loves all the guys that I'm friends and brothers with and realizes what all of us have been through together. And now that I'm retired, you know, she'll actually often say, you know, it's I, you know, this is Amber saying, I think I took for granted being around you and all your friends. I got so used to being around people like you that now that I'm around civilian men, it's hard to see them kind of drift through their lives without any real commitment or dedication to anything with any passion because I've watched you and the guys that you were on teams with put everything in their life into what they were doing. I mean, to, to almost a fault. Yeah. And um, that's something to be proud of. And that's not to be dismissive of other people who didn't do the things we've done, but we aren't normal. Yeah. Um, 
but that's it's okay. just different. It's, it's just a, it's different. A, yeah. yeah. But the important thing is, you know, I'm pontificating a little here, but mm -hmm. the important thing is now is I need to talk to you. I need to talk to Maddie because yeah. I spend a lot of my time now in business talking with people who are not like me. Right. And it would be totally inappropriate if I sat around for an hour talking about how I smoked a bunch of bad guys in Iraq. <laughs> right. None of exactly. them would look at me the same. They'd say, don't invite Kevin to the next staff meeting. He's a right, lunatic. Exactly. He's talking about hand grenades and this, he doesn't know what to say, right? Yeah, they don't, they don't have any relatable experiences that, yes. that are like comparable to that. So yes, and yeah. and I I don't need to talk about those experiences all the time, but I do need to talk about them sometimes because right. they are part of what forged me into who I am today. But I can't talk about them with the guys that weren't there with me, and so it's important for all of us to stay plugged into our uh, uh, tribes that we were once a part of, even in the future, uh, because we'll never realize it at the time, but we're going to need to continue talking to those guys later in life because at some point, whether it's our wife's telling us or it's somebody else or even us realizing, um, we're not normal because we haven't led normal lives. We didn't do, no we haven't done normal things. What we did in our 20s and 30s and 40s were not normal things, man. Right. Um, exactly. And, and we're not going to be normal guys in our 50s and 60s and 70s. But it's okay because, you know, what we did in our 20s and 30s was awesome. <laughs> I agree. I couldn't and agree I more. Think, I think the kinds of guys that we can be in our 50s and 60s is awesome too. Yeah. But, but the bridge there, the bridge is staying in touch with all the guys later in life that were there while we were forging our character and experiences earlier in our life. Yeah, I agree. Because we, if you we, lose we, touch with that, then it's almost like, like kind of like I've kind of alluded to with you. Like you tell me, you say that I need to tell my stories, but then it's like, I haven't talked about that stuff and probably, you know, since I got out. So by not, by not keeping that stuff fresh or at least not talking about it, it will go away. And then, you know, then we forget about where we came from kind of maybe, but um, yeah, I agree, man. I think it's important to, to maintain those relationships for sure. It is. Yeah. Otherwise at some point, it's not just your wife saying you're not normal. It's civilian saying it and then, <laughs> right. and then you're screwed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um, do you want, I, there's that one story. How do you, and you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to, but I thought this was the funniest thing. Uh, talking about when Sean, when you guys are doing that course, you want to talk about that at all? You know what I'm talking about, right? All the appearance changes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how it'll trans. Well, tell it, and then if it doesn't translate on this, I'll just cut it out or whatever. But that was Well, fun. it's, you know, you and I know Sean so well. Oh, you know, best, even now. Best. You know, and that's the thing about not being normal, by the way. This conversation we're having is, it, it feels like I just saw you in office yesterday. Right. Exactly. Same here. And, and in 10 years, at some point, if we're all, you know, camping together, it'll feel like that as well. And if Sean yep. were on here with us, it would be the same exact thing. Yep. Um, and, and that is because we've always been 100% genuine with each other. There's right. never been anything weird or fake, you know? Right. Um, and so, but it's important for anyone who hasn't met Sean to know that he's got like a really, he's incredibly funny, oh. but has like a really dry sense of humor for sure. And will do something that he, he even knows is absolutely hysterical, but do it with a totally straight face. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so, um, we were doing a surveillance course where we were, um, learning, through uh contracted it was a contracted course uh how to perform surveillance in a variety of environments and in this case it included an urban environment so we were surveilling um you know a, a target it was an, an instructor that we were surveil surveilling in a major city 
And so of the, of the tools and techniques that we were taught, it included appearance changes. And so as you move throughout your um, surveillance plan, you always had um, a, another set of clothes with you, whether it was in a backpack, in your car. And so if you thought that the target ever got a glimpse of you, but maybe didn't burn you totally, you could change your appearance very rapidly. So an easy appearance change that almost everybody keeps on hand is you start the day and, you know, a full blown business suit and you keep a set of, you know, running shorts and sneakers and a tank top in your backpack. So if you think you were burned, you could get into your PT gear and instead you look like a, you know, you're going for a jog. Um, and everybody had different approaches to that, but, um, you know, at one point we started the day and you all start in one place, but through the day you're moving around the city, following the target and everybody's communicating. So you always know where everyone is, but guys do appearance changes throughout the day. And they might not always tell you that they've done an appearance change. And so part of, you know, where discipline comes in is where you might see somebody who's on your team who has done an appearance change without telling you, but you can't react to it if you see them and you're in vicinity of the person you're surveilling. And so, you know, we started the day in, you know, basic, uh, you know, rough cities. And at one point, Sean had done an appearance change, but he had put on like a giant sombrero, a glued on, you know, like handlebar mustache and was driving a car. And when I, he pulled up next to me and I looked over, you know, he looked like he should be on like the label of a hot sauce bottle. And I'm like doing everything I can to not lose my composure. And he just looked, you know, dead straight. Like there was absolutely nothing wrong with what he was wearing and kept on going. <laughs> It was oh, great. God, I love that. And that defines him, man. That that kind of humor with just the straight face is like his MO, man. He, you know, oh. What was funny is years later, um, after, you know, when after Gav died, that first 4th of July party we were both at, it was uh, um, crazy hats and mustache was the theme. You remember that? Uh, not really, but go ahead. That was the theme of the party. Everyone was supposed to wear a crazy hat and a mustache. And so, um, Amber and I drove up to Columbus for it and we stayed at Sean's house for the weekend. And I had some shitty glue on mustache I got from like party city. And I showed it to him and he's like, Oh no, 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 no. I have a, I, you remember back when we went to that surveillance course, I bought a, um, Hollywood grade professional costume kit for facial hair. Let me, let me do your mustache for you. And it was like a professional mustache, you know, with glue that like stays on for days. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That dude was awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. I need to, I would love to talk to him again. Maybe I can get him on here or something. Maybe the three of he us. Should. Can He's talking about helicopters still. Oh, is he? Yeah. I didn't. I had lost track of him once. Uh, once I left, so he's he's. Cur I talked to him like two weeks ago. He's currently deployed, flying Apaches. Nice, good for yeah. him. Yeah. Well, uh, it's been about two hours and forty five minutes, which I, I knew it was going to be. We could do. Um, we could probably do this for eight hours, ten hours. Well, it's and funny. that's we without got... you even saying anything about your experience. <laughs> I know. Well, we got Mark and uh, Maddie and you coming up. Uh, is that next week or am I think it's next week? Yeah. So I think that'll, we'll just continue this then. And uh, I'm sure we'll have like hours more. Of it's just going to be like hours of dirty stories. And <laughs> it probably know. wouldn't even be arable. I probably wouldn't even be able, be able to post it. I want to make sure we talk about, you know, I think I mentioned it a little bit. The time in the office where Matt and Mark were simultaneously on equally laughable fad diets <laughs> when Mark yeah. was only drinking slim fast <laughs> and Matt was only eating um, pickled hard boiled eggs. Oh yeah. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> and, and Mark was only drinking slim fast because 
he he was committed to losing uh, a whole bunch of weight. He had put on a bunch of weight after he broke his back and he wanted to uh-huh. lose weight. So he's he would come to work with like two cans of Slim Fast and put them in the fridge. And he's like, that's it. That's all my that's all I'm putting in my body for today. <laughs> Meanwhile, Matt had this like five gallon glass jar of red pickled boiled eggs. And he oh. would just like eat a whole pickled egg every couple hours. I'm like, why are you doing that? He's like, these are like pure protein, man. I got five gallons of pickled eggs at Sam's club and it was like $12. That's like, you know, 15 grams of protein per penny. You can't beat it. I'm like, that's a terrible idea. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So I want, I want to definitely want to talk about stuff like that. We will. All right. Well, listen, obviously I just love catching up with you. Same. Um, I will continue and look forward to um, mocking these degenerates of society who can't put a shopping cart in the right place. Yes. And the um, lunatics who get these vanity license plates. um, And I always look forward to participating in those and seeing what you come up with. Oh yeah. Um, Yeah. I, uh, I definitely keep them coming. Keep, uh, I got to have my allies everywhere. Give me some, give me information. But but listen, thank you for doing this. Um, While I know you were talking to Brandy and Schleich, who were probably like your peers. um, And and by the way, we're only talking about the difference of like two or three years, but things were so intense then. Yeah. The difference between you and me in the 17th then was like an entire generation. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it was yeah. actually, you were actually only a couple of years ahead of me. Right, right. But the yeah. amount of experience you had put us in totally different stadiums. Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, guys like me and Maddie and Richie and, and Gav and Dez and, and all the others, we were riding your coattail. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And so we, we want to hear the stories about like, what was it like to be one of the first guys with RD? Yeah. You know, what, what was it like when, you know, when you were deploying with RD and there was basically nobody to ask questions on how to get ready or yeah. how to be good. And you're just like, I have no idea how to get ready for this. <laughs> and, but I know I have to be ready. And you figured it all out. Okay. No idea what kind of equipment was going to be needed. No idea how to use the equipment that they had and just absolutely getting it done. Let's talk about all that. Okay. All right. All right, brother. All right, man. Talk to you soon. See you next time. Cheers.